you know, I've called this talk uh, The Secret UFO Legacy of Australian Defence Scientist Harry Turner. And this is a guy that most people don't know about. And uh, fortunately, uh, people like Ross Coltart and Bruce Seibel in their uh, Need to Know broadcast or podcast, uh, they covered him recently and uh, um, looks like I'll be doing a, a kind of an interview with Ross and Bruce with fragments of a film you'll see today. You'll see fragments of it. This will be the first time it's been publicly aired. And it's a, an interview that we, uh, uh, myself um, uh, and Dominic McNamara of the Aura Project, which was a, an Australian version of the Disclosure Project uh, that was mainly operational through the mid uh, to uh, late uh, early two, uh, 2000s, from about 2005 through to about, well, actually a little bit earlier than that. And uh, um, because I'd been in contact with Harry for about two decades, I was slowly trying to get him to agree to do a, an oral history interview. And we ended up doing it in 2004. Um, and bearing in mind this guy had very high security clearances, all that kind of stuff cloak and dagger stuff, you'll get to know part of the Harry Turner story, there's absolutely no way I can tell you the whole lot in a very short period of time. Um, but um, we'll just go on to the next slide. Now, here's uh, Ross and Bruce talking about uh, classic UFO investigators. You know, the, the talk there on that particular episode, you can see this on YouTube, it talks about uh, basically uh, uh, Edward Rupolt, who was the uh, uh, leader of Project Blue Book back in the, uh, mainly in the 50s, a uh, classic researcher, but a government researcher, and also Harry Turner. Now, uh, um, Ross didn't know about Harry Turner until he and I met for lunch, sat him down, told him the story of Harry Turner, which sort of blew his mind a bit. And, and then um, going to the archives now today, if you go to the Australian archives or you can just do it in the comfort of your own chair, you can sit down and examine two files uh, through the National Archives. One of them is a DSTO file, uh, and it's on UFOs. And uh, the second one is a JIB, or J I think it was a JIO uh, uh, file. Um, that stands for the Joint Intelligence Bureau, and it became the Joint Intelligence Organisation. And eventually today, it's known as the Defence Intelligence Organisation. And during the 19th... Uh, would it be about the 1970s through to... He, he joined JIB, when it, that's what it was called back then in the 50s, um, and it morphed into the Joint Intelligence Organisation by the early uh, 70s, I think. Um, and then beyond that, it became, uh, as I said, the Defence Intelligence Organisation. If you try and follow the logistics of how federal organisations chop and change over the decades, it, you'd go mad. There's so many ch morphing changes that go on all the time. But uh, um, essentially this is the story of Harry's time with the, jo the Joint Intelligence Bureau and the Joint Intelligence Organisation. So, next one. Have, have a li uh, listen to that program. Just gives you the barest overview of, of Harry. Again, um, a lot of you might watch uh, Project Unity, the podcasts. Uh, this one's very interesting. It go, tries to go into the detail of that uh, JIO file that you can access on the National Archives. But the problem I have with a lot of these analyses is that they didn't... Oh, I'm not, not beginning myself here, but none of them sort of really contacted me to give them the context of the file. Uh, and it's important to have the deep dive con context of these files. And so a lot of people have tended to over-interpret the content of the files and you need to know the detail behind it as to, to understand it because people have run away looking at this file and said, oh, buried in the Australian government files is a file that openly says that there was a UFO crash retrieval program, an anti-gravity program, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, the Australian government has revealed that proof of uh, UFOs, not quite, not quite. It, it would be nice to think that was the case, but there's a hell of a story behind that, and I'll try to cover a little bit of that as, as best as I can. Next. Um, another site, uh, UAP Check. That's an overseas site, mainly based in Europe, that's doing a lot of good work in terms of analysing existing UFO data, UAP data, all that kind of thing. Um, 
I guess everybody knows what a UAP is, don't they? Just, just say UFO. That's, that's what it's all about. I'm still a bit of a UFO guy, and, and I can get into a probably hours-long debate about the relevance of the term UFO versus UAP, but, uh, but I can understand the context of why it's changing. So anyway, unfortunately, we're going to get used to UAP. Um, but they did an article on Harry Turner. Once again, they didn't contact me, but recently I've had emails where they want me to join the group. Uh, and I know a lot of players in the group, uh, Maurizio Verga and others from the Italian UFO groups and quite a few others. But uh, uh, with this, this guy here tried to do a bit of an analysis of the file. But once again, he didn't have the, d the deep detail to understand it fully. He comes up with his own kind of interpretation of, of what the files seem to discuss and seem to imply. But there's, a, as I say, a lot of detail behind the story. Next. That's, he calls it the Harry, Harry Turner bombshell. You know, uh, it, it's, it, it's certainly interesting. Uh, most government files don't have the kind of detail that's in that Harry Turner document. So if you ever have time, just get lost in the, the Joint Intelligence Organisation or JOO file on UFOs. Great reading. Anyway, this is some, you know, I've been, as I said earlier, talking to Harry um, since the days when I was going through the RWF files back between 1982 and 84. And it was during those file searches, and I'll get to that, that kind of led me to Harry Turner. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Anyway, these are some of the areas where I've told the Harry Turner story over the years. Um, a lot of people say, oh, well, we don't know about Harry Turner. And I think that people just, you've got to say to those people, well, you're not taking the effort to find out because, and some of these books and others probably are harder to find, you know. Where, um, but uh, the Oz Files, of course, got a couple of copies here to flog, but uh, Rare Bird and uh, Hair of the Alien, unfortunately, no copies here today. There's one chapter in there which I'll describe in a little bit of detail as, as I go on. Uh, that refers to Harry Turner uh, and uh, an amazing case that he made me aware of. And uh, 2012 book I highly recommend. Uh, it was, uh, as you can see, there's quite a number of authors to it. UFOs and Government, a Historical Quarry. I wrote the Australian chapter and that's about 30 pages. And, uh, but a brilliant history overview. You're like, uh, a lot of people today think the, the UAP game or UFO game started in 2004. Everything before that is irrelevant. I think when you finish today, you realise that uh, there's a very deep, complex history and a lot of the, the so-called discoveries that are occurring today, it's all been done before. It's all been discovered before. Uh, people have been researching this field at a very deep level over the decades and it's a matter of catch up. What, what's happening today, as far as I'm concerned, is catch up. And, uh, but that's the way it is. And uh, the UFO Encyclopedia, there I'm holding the third edition of the UFO Encyclopedia. Massive, you know, like when you think about it, if you go out to a restaurant, you spend a hundred bucks or whatever, spend a hundred bucks or more and get these encyclopedias. You will not regret it, you know. But this is the third edition, the outcoming is the fourth edition in that I've got to, hopefully, if it all comes together, there will be an entry about Harry Turner in that as well and a, quite, and a number of other things. Next. Uh, this is me back uh, a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sitting at the desk of the Director of Public Relations of the RWF or Department of Defence in the, uh, the Russell offices in Canberra. It took me a while to get to that point, but it was during January of 1982. And I think they probably thought, I'm a you know, UFO buff, you know, I'm just going to come in, look at the files for, for an hour or two, go home happy. Well, I arrived on the Monday and left on the Friday. So I was staying with my brother-in-law at the time and I was going backwards and forwards nine to five every single day. I don't think they realised who they let in the door. And, and once I was in there, I was doing a really forensic deep dive on the government files to figure out what the hell the government was on about. And it got kind of crazy by, I don't know, about 1983. I had RWF 
intelligence guys, the guys that did the UFO show, um, contacting me and asking me for advice about their own files. That's how absurd it got. Like somebody from the, the general public could write a, a, a letter or an article and criticise the government about UFOs, but the guys that are supposed to be doing it, the intelligence people and others, didn't know their own files. No, they, they really didn't. They, they had no sense of history. Um, and, and then they realised they had this guy, me, looking at the files in huge amount of detail, you know, and, and I was following the paper trail and uh, looking for file numbers, looking for file references for other organisations, you know, and, and clearly I was an outsider, but uh, once I got into that and dived down really deeply, there were names of people that kept coming up uh, and individuals that I was sort of highlighting that I... I needed to talk to and, and find out more about them. And Harry Turner was one of those guys. Now he, I saw references to him, uh, I'll, I'll go through that as I get to it anyway, but uh, the, the irony was, of it was that I took over the office of the Director of Public Relations in the Department of Defence during January. He's off on his, on his uh, Christmas holidays and the Department of Defence said, Bill, you can have access to the Department of Defence photocopier. I know they're all stamped and all that kind of stuff, but you photograph or photocopy any, anything you, you want out of the files. I think they probably shouldn't have said that to me, but that's the way it was. And when they asked me later, well, you might have to pay for some of these copies. How many did you do? And I said, oh, probably in excess of four or 500 pages or something. Oh, we'll forget about that. And on it went. But... Ultimately, a lot of these files now you can examine once again in the comfort of your, your own home. They're digitised, a lot of them. Well worth having a read if you want to get a sense. You know, I, I had to go through the, the exercise of, of um, because nobody had really looked at these files, I had to assign a, 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 an authority to the effect that you know, I wouldn't reveal witness names and that kind of stuff. And eventually they were going to put them all out uh, um, censored with the personal details of the witnesses and stuff like that and then later on they come onto the archives no censoring no, they're all, it's all there in black and white uh, so it's uh, they put me through a lot of hoops though unnecessarily because I wanted to follow up certain cases and uh, that's the way it was so next right now having going through all these files I, I came across Harry Turner's name uh, with regard to, in, in a 1969 document that highlighted that he was involved in 1954, 55, and later another file reference uh, to being involved as late as 1960 and the early 1970s. I thought, hey, I've got to find out who this guy is. And uh, it turned out, as I said earlier, that he, at the, uh, during the 70s and 80s, so he retired in 1982, um, he was working for the Joint Intelligence uh, Organisation. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And, uh, and I started putting out feelers through Air Force Intelligence, ASIO, and by the way, guys, I am not an ASIO agent, I assure you, but uh, apparently they helped me find Harry Turner and certainly, uh, basically, Harry Turner's boss, who was the director of the... Uh, the Directorate of Scientific and Technical Intelligence of the Joint Intelligence Organisation, Bob Mathams, um, that was Harry Turner's boss. He, fortuitously for me, in 19, what have been 1982, came out with a book called Sub Rosa. And it was his kind of, in retirement, a book about um, military and political intelligence. And as soon as I saw his name, I thought, that's Harry Turner's boss. So I wrote to his publisher and Bob Mathens kindly came back and he, wrote, he sent me a couple of letters, explained that, yes, Harry had an obsession about UFOs flying saucers. I couldn't stop him. I just let him have his way. And you'll later on see how much of a way he had. But uh, it's quite an amazing story. But eventually I get this letter. Dear Mr Chalker, messages from Bob Mathens and from JIO have been received indicating your interest in contacting me regarding UFOs. As I have investigated so many aspects of this subject with 
within and without the RWF, I am not able to anticipate your particular interests. Perhaps you would care to outline your objectives and interests in a letter to the above address for my uh, better understanding of your requirements. At present, I would be able to only answer from memory as all my UFO files are in storage together with our furniture uh, for at least several months while our new home is being planned and built. Yours sincerely, O.H. Turner. So I thought, oh, good stuff. Anyway, I, I had the first of the telephone interview uh, uh, with him in January and then over the next decade, I must have talked to him uh, hundreds of times and eventually it, it was a, a hard thing getting to meet him physically and the background to this was that um, his wife finally gets Harry in retirement and uh, she didn't really, the, the sense of I got of it was she didn't really care to have him being obsessed about flying saucers yet again in retirement. Um, and uh, here was this guy, Bill Chalker, wanting to talk to him about UFOs, about his role in government. And uh, I could sense whenever I was talking to his wife, it was like talking through a very icy fog. Like, she clearly didn't want me to make contact with Harry. And in fact, the first meeting we had in person was at the local RSL club. <laughs> we had this kind of open discussion, and the implication I got was that eventually, if I could thaw out his wife and get a, a more pleasant reception, uh, we eventually be able to talk at his place, but that took a long time. I'm talking over a, a span of many years. So uh, a lot of the information I gathered up to that point was uh, kind of uh, gaps, trying to fill in details. And uh, you, in order to get really good detail, you really need to take the deep dive, and I mean very deep dive. Now, and eventually I was talking to not only Harry, but Harry's associates, the chief defence scientists, uh, several of them, um, a lot of deputy defence science leaders. Uh, once they realised that they're talking to somebody that's serious about doing a really careful investigation, they all started to open up. Um, so you'll see parts of this story as we go through. Next. Right. Just give me a hoy when it gets close to break time and uh, about five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, or five minutes before the break. Yep. Uh, this is a recent article that you can find if uh, anybody familiar with New Dawn magazine. Uh, you can get this as a back issue. It's New Dawn is uh, kind of the kind of magazine I suspect a lot of people that come here would like to read regularly. It's into all sorts of stuff. Um, and uh, a few years ago they got me to uh, do a range of articles and I really like the way they presented their articles and stuff like that. Um, now, you've got to evaluate each article uh, on its content and credibility, but I did a whole series of articles for them uh, about a couple of years ago. I think this, I can't remember when this, this is uh, uh, yeah, January, February 2022, so it's fairly recent. And I did articles about the 1868 Birmingham case, the UFO landing in Parramatta Park, uh, that kind of thing, and a whole range of other things. Um, but this is probably the, the, the most comprehensive article that's gone into print in Australia about Harry Turner's story at this stage. Um, and so I entitled Harry Turner and the Secret UFO Science Wars of Oz. You know, he was probably the most determined person within the secret government community promoting the idea that UFOs were a serious phenomenon that, that should be examined. But he was working in the, the clandestine world and nobody was aware of this. Uh, next. A couple of, you know, I do a regular column for UFO uh, um, uh, Truth, uh, the British magazine. You know, I recommended that. Uh, but I do a, a monthly, bi-monthly, monthly column. Yeah, and uh, um, I did a two-part thing there, pretty similar to the New Dawn article. And uh, one of the things I liked was that uh, one of the reports that was coming out of the brand new uh, 
UAP task force uh, uh, in, uh, when was it, 2021, uh, because of the difference of time between the uh, United States and Australia. I'm reading that on the 26th of June, 2021. And that's a special day for me because it's my birthday anyway. But uh, at the same time, I realised that, uh, how long ago was it? It was uh, uh, 67 years earlier. Also on June 26 was this article. Now, we go to the next one. Hopefully it's probably in order. Uh, no, I'm asking the question, who was Harry Turner? You'll, you'll get to know something about him. You won't know the full story, but um, here he is as a, a young uh, Army Air Force officer. Um, as a background, he graduated in science at Perth University. Um, and uh, he was a big player in the early development of radar in Australia. And he went to the legendary Bailey Boys courses during World War II, which were designed to uh, improve and create modern day radar for the protection of Australia. And that's the, one of the graduation groups and Harry, you'll see a larger photograph of that. These are photographs that have never been publicised before, the, the two at the bottom. Um, but they're showing Harry at Harwell, which is the atomic research establishment in England. Now, this guy had a lot of heavy duty background and he was involved as the Australian Chief Health Physics Officer at the Maralinga bomb trials. Now, if anybody knows, you ought to learn your, your own personal history. Uh, um, I remember reading, um, any, anybody heard of John Howard? Our pro former Prime Minister? Yeah. He wrote a book called Lazarus Rising. Brilliant book. It's good, a good read about a uh, young kid in Australia who was big on brill cream and all the rest of it and uh, becoming Prime Minister of our country. Now, uh, I don't know what your politics are, but uh, I never really saw much that I liked in what John Howard did. But that biography, Lazarus Rising, was really good. But then he did a follow-up book called The Menzies Legacy, I think, or The Menzies Years, um, something like that. And I immediately went to... Menzies was our longest serving Prime Minister, covered the 50s and in, into the 60s, and I went to see what coverage was there about Menzies and the Maralinga bomb trials. You go to it and it's less than a paragraph. Now, and when you realise what happened at Maralinga and at Montebello off the West Australian coast, uh, and there's a great book out at the moment called Operation Hurricane about the first British bomb test, you've got to wonder why did Menzies um, give over Australian landmass to atomic bomb trials that led to a lot of contamination around Australia. Uh, you know, just crazy stuff. But uh, in hindsight, I guess you can argue it was the wisdom of the time that people wanted to support the British Empire um, at all costs. And the Americans had the bomb, the Russians had the bomb, and it was about time that the motherland had the bomb as well. Yeah, sure, you can blow up bombs on, in, in our soil. That seemed to be the mentality. But it, it was really, in hindsight, a really bad thing for Australia. But anyway, I, I won't get on too much of a pedestal there for that. But these are later photographs of Harry in retirement and Harry and myself uh, at the uh, oral history interview that we did in 2004. Now, I first met Harry face to face, I think, Goodness, I think it was about 2000, 2001, and, uh, and it was trying to thaw out his wife's uh, uh, resistance to having a, an outsider coming in and, and reigniting Harry's interest in UFOs. Um, anyway, Harry was born in 1923, died in 2014 at the age of 91. Now, for somebody who was out there at the Maralinga bomb trials, running around trying to follow what the British were doing, and you've got to understand the British weren't very transparent about what they were doing on Australian soil. Um, he's leading an Australian team around trying to uh, basically monitor the, the extent of radiation and that kind of stuff. And you, um, the history of it is quite mind-boggling. Anyway, but I'm not going to be talking much about the atomic bomb. But next. Now, as I was going through the files, 
there was, in 1969, uh, an attempt by DAFI, and DAFI stands for the Directorate of, of Air Force Intelligence. Um, and they did a review, or at least one officer did a review of their files. You know, when I saw this file, I was amazed. For the first time in a decade or more, there was an attempt to try and understand what was going on in their own files and what, and what they'd been doing. And I've got to say, it wasn't much of a review. But right at the end of it, it comes out, a special section will deal with an investigation carried out by Mr O. H. Turner in 1954. What a, what a, uh, next one. Here it is. In 1954, Mr O. H. Turner, then a member of the physics department of the Melbourne University, requested permission to do a study on UFOs in Australia. Um, this permission was given and so Turner carried out he, this study. Uh, his report is rather lengthy but his conclusion and recommendations are attached. Mr Turner then left Australia for the United Kingdom. After his return to Australia he again approached the Daffy or Daff, Daffy uh, from his new position in the scientific intelligence section of JIB. Uh, permission was again given to him to investigate the UFO files in late 1968. This permission was given unofficially by um, the director of uh, um, DAFI Ops um, with the director's agreement. On Mr Turner's suggestion, a new report form was devised in May 1969 and forwarded to commands. Uh, this form will give a more scientific slant to the reports. Um, note should be made that the 1954 report was largely based on American information by a major KEO. This KEO, misspelt, uh, report has been proved to be an unofficial, highly biased opinion by an ex-Marine officer turned science fiction writer. Uh, which is basically, pardon the French, bullshit. But, but it was a part of a campaign to uh, undermine the credibility of Donald Keogh. Uh, if, if nobody knows who Donald Keogh is, that's another person you need to find out about. Donald Keogh was quite, quite a, a figure in uh, American <coughs> ufology and wrote a couple of best-selling books, or numbered best-selling books, during the 1950s. Uh, Turner also disagrees with Dr Condon's findings, all correspondence on this topic, is attached at Annex J. Now it's a long, long analysis but I can assure you not all correspondence was attached. It was a very highly uh, kind of, I, I just don't think they knew their own files well enough to, to dig down to get sufficient detail. Um, anyway, Flight Lieutenant K. Jordan did a good job considering how uh, detached Air Force intelligence were from the UFO problem. Um, they'd, I don't think they really knew the extent of their own files and, and what, what they'd been doing for decades. Anyway, next. Ah, bit of a quick background. Harry Bourne, yeah, this will give you a reason to, con to think about Harry Turner. Harry Turner obviously had a very deep scientific background but his upbringing allowed him to broaden his perspective to a much deeper level. And he was one of the earliest scientific military intelligence people that was exposing the connection that everybody seems to have found and discovered in the last 10 years. And Harry, here's Harry dealing with it in the 1950s and as early as 1940, uh, the so-called what we, we, we interpret as the paranormal or psychic connection. Um, and a lot of current players believe they've done all the, the real brand new work, but it, the point I'm trying to make here is it was all done before by uh, not only Harry Turner, but others. But Harry had an unusual upbringing. Uh, born in Perth, Western Australia in 1923, comes under the influence of a psychic, Mrs Phipps. Now Mrs Phipps was a psychic back in the 20s and 30s and she was brought in by the Western Australian police to deal with difficult cases and apparently was of some benefit to their 
criminal investigations. Obviously, the police didn't make a big deal of using a psychic to solve your um, disappearances or murders and that kind of stuff or crimes. But uh, this was way back then, uh, in the, the 1930s in particular, uh, that Mrs Phipps was being used. And uh, he, uh, she, he, Harry Turner became part of what, she, what he referred to as a development circle. Now, that to me appeared to be a euphemism for things like uh, psychic uh, seances, uh, uh, paranormal circles, that kind of stuff. So he's doing what a lot of people are into uh, these days over the last few decades, you know, all these kind of psychic groups, that kind of thing. Anyway, and also he starts to consider the nature of time, reality and psychic phenomena. He completes a Bachelor of Science at the University of Western Australia. During the war with Army Air Force credentials, he completes a, a, a crash course in radio location. Now, radio location became what is known today as radar. Um, and, and, the full, uh, and they were the forerunner of, of radar, uh, the famous Bailey Boys course that he did. Here he is here. Uh, at, that's at the University of Sydney. And there was a, you had to have security clearances, all that kind of stuff, and you also had to be a member of the military. Remember, this was during World War II, and we were trying to defend us. That, that group was helping in the defence of Australia. And, and they were terrified that they were they were going to be invaded by Japan at that point in time. Uh, and so there was an attempt to develop radar at a very high, high pace, and they succeeded up to a point. Um, but you've got to realise that radar coverage back in the 50s was very thin on the ground. Um, you had your Nowra, uh, Sydney, and a couple of other places, um, South Australia because of its security base and that kind of thing. Uh, next. Oh, hang on. Before we go off there... Um, by 1946, he's part of what's called a rescue group. Now, that's a euphemism, again, for a paranormal psychic group. Um, a psychic circle, but it's also into cutting-edge physics and science. Um, and what I was trying to explain earlier, he had a foot in two worlds, the real world, the uh, science, military intelligence, all that kind of stuff, and the paranormal world. And he starts to become aware of the flying saucer phenomena, which kicks off in a big public way in 1947. Uh, and he says that he was starting to look at that problem in 1948. So he was a very early player to begin with. And he's beginning his research in flying saucers. By 1949, he's involved with research at Woomera and Port Wakefield. Both those places are in South Australia, where essentially military testing areas. He was uh, testing and developing Doppler radar systems and uh, uh, monitoring of rocket tests and that kind of thing that the Brits were doing, all that kind of thing. And then uh, interest, uh, he, he was finding that lots of people had interests within that secret world of flying saucers, psychic phenomena and dimensional, dimensional physics. Now, the big play at the moment in the last decade is maybe UFOs are dimensional. Well... Harry Turner and a whole lot of other people that haven't had much publicity have done it all before. It, to me, it's like deja vu, what's happening in the last decade or so. Uh, and so I'm really an advocate of a lot of the modern players need to know their history. They really do, because they will save a lot of time. Uh, but next. Now, along came 1954. Now, 1954, I actually wrote for the 19, the 50th anniversary of Kenneth Arnold sighting. Uh, I think Maura McGee put this out. Is Maura here today? No? no. But anyway, it's a um, um, uh, proceedings of a conference back then here in Sydney. And in there I did a, uh, a paper called The 1954 UFO Invasion of Australia. There was, we were besieged by UFO reports. Luckily Harry was there to investigate clandestinely. Um, the first of these things, um, uh, and I know, I know this was advertised as giving two lectures, that it'll be just the one lecture, and I'll occasionally refer to one of my favourite areas of interest, and that's solid light cases. Well, almost on January 1, there was a case that involved a Convair uh, ANA P 
pilot, but he wasn't in a plane at that time. He was at his home and witnesses this massive object coming out and it extended a, a, a kind of a, a shaft down below and there was something at the bottom of that shaft. And to me, it almost read like a classic example of one of my favourite areas of investigation, solid light. Now, solid light is a term that's been used euphemistically over the decades, but it, it might be a complete inaccurate uh, word to account for what's being seen, but there's many UFO reports over the decades where this seems to be like the deployment of what appears to be either tubes of light. Uh, they slowly progress and they slowly retract. They generally aren't divergent, sometimes are, but they also seem to pick up things like people, cattle, you know, objects, all that kind of stuff. And it's been happening for the entire history of the modern UFO phenomenon. And indeed, there seem to be reports going back decades. Anyway, I digress. And, uh, but through this period, Harry Turner's is at the Department of Supply, Salisbury and Woomera, the rocket tracking, Doppler research uh, in, in the UK at Cavendish Laboratories in Cambridge, cosmic radiation research at the University of Western Australia, three years at the University of Oxford doing nuclear physics and also dealing with the atomic energy research establishment at Harwell. Now, you need to understand that every one of those research projects was so heavily compartmentalised that anybody outside these particular programs didn't know what the hell was going on. It was all done in, in secret, and particularly at Harwell, because it was the atomic research establishment of Britain. Uh, anybody outside the program, half the time, you know, like he, he, he highlighted in the interviews we did with him that he would turn up at Harwell and then a car would arrive and take him to Aldermaston. Now, Aldermaston is the, the centre of nuclear research in Britain. And then at the end of the day, he would come back by the same car and be back at Harwell. And for the record, he spent the day at Harwell. He never went to Aldermaston. So all this kind of cloak and dagger stuff, it was so heavily compartmentalised. And at the same time as Harry in the secret domain, we had people like Edgar Jarrell, the, I guess the pioneer figure of Australian ufology, conducting UFO research. Um, here is an article in the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, I had to laugh when... Anybody read the Sydney Morning Herald here these days? Gee. One, the Sydney Morning Herald will be disappointed. But anyway, they've come up with a new column called CBD. It's sort of like a gossip kind of column. And in there... Uh, it only just started, and I've got to say, the level of journalism, they, they suddenly have become obsessed about UFOs, and the level of research and investigation is appallingly low. It's like being there, done that for decades. You know, they've got to come up to speed, you know, and, I, and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to write for them as long as they paid for it, that kind of stuff, but it, it's just so depressing to see re references to little green men, uh, flying saucers from Mars, tinfoil hats, and here's back, I, I was going to remind them, I'm actually going to do a blog on this, where I'm going to compare their journalism in the last couple of weeks to stuff that was written back in 1950 for the Sydney Morning Herald. Here they're referring to Edgar Jarrell, and you've got to admit it was probably a bit out of touch, but at the time, leading astronomers like Vaucluse and others, back in the 1950s, were saying that maybe Mars was the origin point of aliens and it was real life. You know, it was widespread scientific belief that there could be intelligent life on Mars, particularly during the 1950s. And then eventually, as we learnt more and more, that idea started to fall away. Uh, maybe the, you know, the debate's still there. Maybe there was intelligent life, whatever. Uh, but here's Edgar Jarrell saying it. And if we go to the next slide, here's a, uh, the reproduction of this article I've referred to earlier, 26th of June, 1954. And it says here, uh, an eminent Australian nuclear physicist who has investigated sources um, uh, reports since 1948 explains scientifically uh, what could be behind the sightings. His name must be withheld uh, at his, uh, as, as he's linked to with high-level research. Now, um, 
I'm guessing that you might have worked out who that person was. Uh, it was Harry Turner. Now, um, and it, he had three ideas there. First hypothesis, a certain remnant of reports of unidentified flying objects may only be explained by the assumption that machines controlled by some intelligence are being observed. Second hypothesis, these machines are not manufactured on Earth, that is, their origin is extraterrestrial. And the third hypothesis, these machines originate from the planet Mars. Now, in retrospect, that seems absurd. But as I said, leading scientists and astronomers were speculating about intelligent life on Mars and that maybe some, you know, it might be behind some of the flying source reports because every time Mars got close, there seemed to be a peak in reports. And that's what Edgar Gerald and others and Turner and others were relating to. Why was there this peak of sightings taking place every time Mars got to its closest point? Well, in astronomical terms, it meant bugger all. There, there, it wasn't that much difference, but uh, there was this correlation. That correlation lasted for a, probably a decade or more, and then it just fizzled out. Maybe they got faster and whatever, and they didn't need to worry about proximity of planets, whatever. But anyway, um, what seems to be a bit of an absurd hypothesis was particularly interesting at that time. So, um, but it talked about in the report there, the article, the Argus had got the ear of Turner. He writes this uh, anonymous article, and in there he's talking about his own investigations uh, that he did. Now we're going for time, by the way. Um, yep, plenty of time. Um, the, uh, um, the wave of UFO reports in Australia was most prominent in Victoria. There were close encounter reports. A uh, fellow saw an egg-shaped object which had, appeared to have people inside of it going over Malvern. Uh, the most impressive civilian report of the day uh, was a case that occurred in the Dandenongs uh, that involved a young girl, I think Marlene Travis, I think from memory, um, seeing uh, uh, an object that looked for, and this is one of the, uh, the, the difficulties of it, it looked like a classic Adamski disc. Uh, now, with Adamski, I don't know who's it, anybody here a fan of Adamski? Good, I'm not speaking out of, oh, okay, we can have an argument later if you like. But anyway, um, the, the, um, Adamski, very colourful character in the history of ufology, um, but he argued he, he, led, he took these very clear photographs. Um, what they represent is a matter of debate. Um, but uh, here was this young girl, 16. Turner investigated her in secret. He, had, as I mentioned earlier, he'd gone along to the Department of Defence, uh, Daffy officers, and said what are you doing about all these flying saucer reports? And then they realised he had a, a classification rating and uh, uh, that gave him access to the files. Um, and they asked him to investigate it because uh, only a few days before, because of all the publicity about all these flying saucer reports around Victoria in particular, the government was being hammered. What are you doing about flying saucers? All this kind of stuff. They're getting pressured left, right and centre. And they realised that they had been dragging the chain and Air Force Intelligence weren't doing very serious investigations of, of these sightings. And along comes this scientist with security clearances. He wants to look into it. So they said, yeah, we'll uh, pay for you to, and give you a car and all that kind of stuff. Go off and do investigations for us. And by the way, here's all our files. You go through it and do a, what they called a scientific appreciation of it. And they thought their problems were solved. They could talk to their political masters, the Minister of Air, and say, yep, we've got somebody on to this, somebody with credentials. Um, unfortunately, they didn't know who they let loose. Um, Harry was doing his own private research. He was doing, interacting with the early flying saucer groups. He wasn't highlighting that he was from government you know, or anything like that, but he was doing a very serious investigation of the problem, trying to figure out what the hell was going on. And... Uh, Go next one. Actually, probably a good point to run the first video if we can. Now, just to give a background of this video, this is an oral history interview that was done by, that, that I organised after having spoken to Harry for decades and slowly trying to get um, agreement that it, 
we could get an interview done, there was a narrow window of opportunity that we could get him on video. As soon as I got him convinced and certainly had his wife on board at that stage, which amazed me even to this day, um, he agrees to do the interview. I ring up Dominic and say, we've got to get up to Moulin Bar. No, we, we, and, and meet me at the Moulin Bar train station and I'll drive you over. Because uh, I, I, I couldn't reveal where he lived and all that kind of stuff. And, and then he comes along, we go, and this is the result of, of the interview. The, uh, this is the, the early part of it. Which uh, uh, divided the, the highway uh, from the new construction of uh, the Heinz uh, uh, you know, 47 variety of people. He's talking about the Dandenong sighting here. Looking after the construction, and um, he reported as, uh, as, as, as sightings as well. Could, could we just go and back a, a fraction? Thing. Maybe about another minute earlier? Yep. Hopefully this will work. And it won't self destruct like Mission Impossible. <laughs> Yeah, that'll do. This is to that particular event. Uh, it turned out that there is a whole series of witnesses or a whole series of events. Uh, the thing uh, it became much enlarged. And there's also uh, uh, physical factors that the brother of the girl who, uh, who saw it uh, was um, involved with the... Um, uh, whether it's the cinema or the uh, it's one media the group, I've forgotten, but anyway, he had access to magnetic readings and things. And he took the watch the girl was wearing and found because the watch had stopped and uh, found it to stop because it was highly magnetized. Oh. And um, they uh, demagnetized it and the watch worked. Mm. Uh, and the, I interviewed the person who did this. Uh, where it, well, I can't remember now where it was, and uh, he confirmed that this is what happened. And so I felt that for the first time I was getting some uh, physical evidence associated with this. Right, uh, yeah. Yeah. I just and, want to go uh, my notes here too. And about this time also, uh, for reasons I don't quite know, is that the Department of Transport was brought into the picture. They wanted to measure the magnetic field of the fence of the... Uh, the UFO was allegedly hovering over a fence which uh, uh, divided the, the highway uh, from the new construction of uh, the Heinz uh, uh, you know, 47 variety of people. Yes. And he was a, a caretaker there looking after the construction and um, he reported this, uh, this, this sightings as well. And somehow or other, the, the Department of Transport got in uh, to the act, and they were measuring the polarity of the um, of the fence posts. And they um, said that normally these are polarised by the action of the traffic. The traffic, the uh, magnetic field of the cars produces a magnetic uh, attraction. But normally, uh, the post. This is according to the story of the, from the man that did this. Uh, normally the post have alternate uh, polarities, so the overall effect is zero. But in the vicinity of this um, uh, of this of the UFO sighting, they were all positive in one particular direction. They, it wasn't abnormal. But at the same time, he wasn't prepared to say that this was so abnormal that it meant something. He was right. sort of lucky for colour. Uh, <laughs> that happens a lot. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and um, there are, uh, now in my report, it, it's got all the subsequent sightings uh, listed, so I won't go into those details. But it, the information was um, uh, fairly convincing. The girl was only 16, but she was um, uh, seemed to be uh, a, a competent witness. And um, the family saw it several times afterwards. And in fact, it got to the point where they got a bit fed up and uh, wouldn't bother looking at it. Um, they were all uh, deeply concerned and uh, they were very uh, cooperative and supportive of me. And while I was there, different other people arrived. I can't remember who they were, but there were different other people interviewing 
said it wasn't restricted just to myself. Right. Uh, but these are the civilian groups? The, mm -hmm. the civilian group? The, which group? The other people who arrived, was that the civilian I, I, I think they were they civilians, yeah. though they were uh, probably the Victorians people. Right, right. so uh, from your memory or from your knowledge, Yours was the only so so called official. I S yes I S that's that's for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, I became aware separately of, of a um, the possibility of another gentleman, a, a, an official guy, uh, an army engineer by the name of Bert Riddell, R I D -L, -L, D E Double L, Bert Riddell. No, I don't know. Right. Because well, I, I remember uh, when you first told me about this yourself, I maybe. You, you had to involve with this civilian group at the time as well, you know, in a separate thing. In a separate thing, yeah. yeah but, but there were some, um, there may, maybe Riddle's um, interviews, I've been told that he undertook some interviews with the Dandenong girl. Well, he probably did, but I um, mean, if he if he ever gave you a name, I wouldn't have remembered it. Right. Uh, but uh, just a, a person. But you, were you ever privy to the uh, Air Force or Army's? Um, Actual report, or was it under your own investigation that you were aware of? There, uh, only my own. Uh, like, uh, they <clears throat> they gave me, and I was very surprised at this. I, I it was cleared a secret uh, for my work with the supplier, uh, but I wasn't um, uh, given uh, any special uh, instruction about this. They handed me the files, um, the, the files they had. Which I took to the university with me. Right. Um, and so you were allowed to do that, were you? Or? Yeah. Well, I don't think I should have been. That's a bit surprising. That the... I was a bit surprised, uh, but um, well, they were so anxious to get answers. Right. right. So that, those files that that, that, were, that were given to you at that time, what was the extent of those files? How much did they involve? Were they? Um, well, a lot of them been destroyed. Um, the uh, my information is that when they moved from Melbourne to Canberra. The instructions were to destroy all files prior to some date. Yeah. We'll just stop uh, this there. Is, uh, okay. Purely uh, to simplify the transfer. Uh, right. That was the story. Okay. Let's see if we can get it back to the presentation. How are we going for time? A good half hour. Good half hour, okay. okay. You'll just have to put up with me for another half hour or so, and then you can have a break. Um, now, um, so what, what that in part of the interview, and just to be, uh, clarify things, when Turner was told that the Department of Defence would pay all his expenses, pay for a car, all that kind of stuff, he refused that. Uh, he said he, he doesn't want any money coming to him from the... Whoops. He doesn't want any money coming from the Department of Defence. Um, he wanted to remain independent, so he was undertaking essentially an independent um, sci scientist uh, evaluation of the defence data. And that's important to understand. The defence evaluations that he did remain classified and I wouldn't see any of that until uh, sometime between 82 and 84. And that was uh, what became known as Turner's 1954 report, which you'll see copies of. You can see that online as well today uh, by going to the National Archives. Next. Now, uh, this, you know, he's talking about in that interview all the early files and some of them being destroyed. Well, some of them were destroyed. But here am I monitoring what's coming out of the defence black hole that's there archives and then they would contact the, the National Archives and say, oh, we've got some files that we're going to send to you. And on, in 19, October 1999, this file becomes available and I see it on their website and I thought, holy shit, sorry for their language, but this I knew was the part of the early UFO files prior to 1954 or would have included some of it. So I tore off in my car up to Canberra, to the archives, and I was probably amongst one of the first to have a look at this file. And sure enough, you can see this file now at the archives and have a look through it. Now, it had some of the early files. 
So ultimately, Turner's report has a summary table listing all these cases. There are not that many of them, and that's why he chose to compare the Australian data to the US data. Now, the most... Um, you kind of have this perception that the Americans are keeping us all informed what we're doing at a clandestine level in defence relationships, but the reality of it is that uh, there's a lot of compartmentalisation that goes beyond bet between allies, that the Americans don't tell us everything, we don't tell everybody, uh, other countries what we're doing half the time. A lot of compartmentalisation going on. But even Turner with his classifications, and he'd gone across in 53 and got CIA briefings on various atomic issues and stuff like that, but he couldn't get detail on the... Um, American UFO data. And so here was a book, uh, Donald Keogh again, best-selling book, um, sold uh, a lot of copies in hardback, came out in 1953, uh, flying saucers are, are real, or fl no, sorry, flying saucers from outer space. And in that book, it had, I think, uh, up to 12 or 24 official US Air Force cases given to him by the Department of Media in the, um, the American defence hierarchy. And these were uh, allegedly purported to be authentic documents. Al Chop, the, the name of the guy who was a friend of his, gave him these reports and he published them. Uh, but he did a lot of over-interpretation and stuff like that. But the US Air Force started to attack Donald Keogh and said that he's just a science fiction writer. Well, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think Donald Keogh wrote something. He might have written the odd book about science fiction, but he was best known to be the uh, support pilot who flew uh, Charles Lindenberg after the uh, cross-Atlantic flight. Uh, Lindenberg became the most famous man in the world during 1927 when he did that flight. Uh, when you compare it to the flights that Kingsford Smith did, uh, like the flight across the Atlantic was just a baby step. So, <laughs> but. Lindenberg became world famous and uh, Keogh was his local American pilot flying him around America for all the publicity stuff. So Keogh got to know Lindenberg. But then during 1954 he comes out with this book, Flying Sources from Outer Space, and it has all these American military cases in there. Um, he's being attacked by the US Air Force, the Defence, saying that uh, it's, they're not authentic as it turns out, that was a lie. Uh, they were real American military defence cases. And that's what Turner used to compare to the Australian data. Um, and we go to the next one. Um, and he drew conclusions. Um, now, some of these conclusions are pretty extraordinary. Um, if we go on, uh, on to the next one, I think, yeah. This is the major barn burner conclusion. The evidence presented by the reports held by the RAAF tend to support the conclusion that certain strange aircraft have been observed to behave in a manner suggestive of extraterrestrial origin. That's Harry Turner writing in 1954. That report was kept secret. Now, this is, wasn't what Air Force Intelligence were expecting from their uh, scientists who had a, uh, a high security clearance, they were expecting some sort of token study, not, you know, and, and they tried to hide this from the, <laughs> the minister, uh, and uh, uh, it just wasn't what they were wanting at that point in time, and it was creating a real problem within uh, the Australian defence hierarchy. So what did they do? They contacted the... Um, Australian military attaché in Washington, D.C., who got in touch with the United States Air Force. The United States Air Force came back and said, yeah, Donald Keogh is a science fiction writer, can't be trusted, and the reports he's using are not government data. Total lie. You know, like, <laughs> it was staggering you know, what they what he did at the time. And so uh, you, you've got this situation where U.S. military intervention and information passed on to the Australian Defence Department which was clearly inaccurate, literally derailed the first attempts at scientific investigation of UFOs in Australia back in 1954. Uh, Turner goes on after this. Next slide. 
Oh, but if we go back just for a second. Uh, no, that, that's his reference to the Dandenong one. Here he calls that one a definite UFO. And, and there's another case in that data where he talks about the... Uh, uh, and this one was not known to the general public, and this is a radar visual report, or a simultaneous radar visual report, during a Canberra bomber test over Maraling Maralinga. Oh, no, sorry, not Maralinga, at, at, at uh, Woomera. At Woomera. Um, they were doing rocket tests, uh, British rocket tests. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the details of that. that it literally is staggering, the, the report. Anyway, next. Uh, that's Don Keo. That's his book, uh, Flying Sources from Outer Space. Two, two editions of it. And this is Albert Chop from the Air Force press desk confirming on the back of the book that these were officially released reports. And yet the Air Force still denied that. For years they would deny that. But they, they were official releases. Next. This is the Canberra bomber story. This is the one that, that really impressed Harry Turner. Now, you've got to remember, here's Harry having spent years since World War II doing radio location, the pioneering work behind radar. And he sees this case in the Air Force files. He thought, wacko, you know, something that I know about in great detail, radar. And so he's studying this. There's a drawing of the radar display off the left-hand corner. Um, there's the account from the radar guy, a photograph of the early Canberra bombers. Just bear in mind that the Canberra bomber, its design was that pilots couldn't really see what was behind them. Uh, I don't know, you would have thought they would have put a rear vision mirror in, maybe, but no, apparently not. But uh, here's the report. There's the radar report. It's tracked on radar, um, and the speed in which the object left uh, was reported to be, I think that was, um, I believe it was supposed to be close to over two to 3,000 miles per hour. That was phenomenal, <laughs> absolutely phenomenal. That's what attracted Harry's attention, you know. And then there were ground witnesses as well. And this is the ground witness statement. I was at range one post R1, uh, the radar post, standing by the security officer's hut and looking towards the radar post at approximately 16.45 hours. Now, there's a discrepancy in terms of time, which I'm not sure what's going on there. So maybe, uh, but according to Turner, it was a simultaneous radar visual event. Uh, but uh, observing one of our trials through binoculars, now that trial was a Canberra bomber flying over the airstrip, flying around and about to launch a dummy missile and they're going to track it on radar. That was the test. Uh, and the object appeared uh, to be travelling towards me or directly um, across a path of the approaching Canberra bomber. Uh, when it got to the path of the Canberra, it turned to my right and was going in the direction from which the Canberra had just come. When it got directly over the Canberra, it slowed down. So the object comes over the top behind the Canberra and is sitting directly above the back of the Canberra bomber. And then it, uh, it, it, when it slowed down, during this time, he's watching it with binoculars, he's saying, I found it very hard to believe what I was seeing. Now, this here's this a trained observer looking at this thing and thinking, I cannot believe what I'm looking at. Anyway, um, so I shut my eyes, <laughs> uh, which he shouldn't have. He wished he kept his eyes open. But, uh, and then looked again through the binoculars and the object was still stationary above the flight path of the Canberra. Since it appeared to be the same relative size as the Canberra uh, through the binoculars, um, I thought it would be possible to see it with the naked eye. However, when I looked over the top of my binoculars, the object had either gone or I could not see it with the naked eye. And when it look, I looked again through the binoculars, I could not pick it up. The object appeared to be travelling about three times as fast as the Canberra, but of course it's impossible to estimate since I did not know what height it was. It was perfectly circular at all times, a grey, uh, dark grey colour, 
and gave the appearance of being translucent. It did not glisten at all when it turned and, and it was, was shiny. Sydney Baker, Vickers Armstrong, that's the British um, aerospace type organisation. So a pretty extraordinary report. Now, Harry only had limited data. He wished he'd been there, but he's investigating it after the fact. And he's thinking, God, you know, a lost opportunity. So much data. He could interpret from that data that the object, a velocity, uh, that it appeared to be objectively real, it wasn't a reflection, and also that it had a, a, a dimensional size estimate that could be confirmed from the radar data, which suggested rather than a, about the same size as the bomber, and apparently it was about twice the size of the bomber. But the bomber pilots saw nothing. It was always behind the aircraft. Uh, but both the bomber and the UFO were being tracked on radar. So pretty extraordinary report for Harry, and particularly with a person whose training background research was in radar. You know, perfect person to analyse the report. Next. OK. Now, in Harry's secret report, apart from saying that they're probably extraterrestrial, um, he also recommended that we should be using radar in as many cases as we can to try and track what these are because the radar that they had set up and that they had a particular variation on the radar that they had developed that allowed them to do both um, Doppler radar, eliminate uh, hovering objects, all that kind of stuff. They were at the early, uh, really at the cutting edge of radar development. Radar from the World War One, uh, two rather, was pretty basic, uh, but uh, Turner and, and others uh, were behind a lot of the improvements of uh, Doppler radar, and they also had a uh, amazingly a, a, a way of translating the the radar feedback into uh, a, an audio channel that gave you almost a, an approximation of the sound of the, the object. And all that. it sounds pretty bizarre, but they could literally got to a point where they could track people walking across the desert, and you could hear the footsteps, you could hear the kangaroos, and you could and and they thought. That would be brilliant if we could use that in UFO research, but of course it never was. But uh, today's radar doesn't do that uh, for some whatever reason. Anyway, but the, during Harry's watch, but he, he didn't become aware of this because at the time this leaked out, um, uh, Seamus O'Farrell or James O'Farrell was a, a naval sea fury pilot based at Nara Air Station. And he's doing a routine cross-country flight and uh, he's got to do a routine check. He's expecting Nara to contact him and along come two objects that take up position either side of his aircraft and he's starting to freak out um, because these objects are starting to close in on him. He's fearing a mid-air crash. Um, He's wondering what he should do. He could see his entire naval career going down the, the drain if he reported it. And so he's sitting there waiting for the routine call while he's got company. And the routine call comes in, do the usual obligatory confirmations of this routine cross-country. It was hardly routine to, Harry, uh, to, to uh, Seamus at that time. He then, uh, uh, the narrow control said, oh, by the way, you got company up there, have you? And, the, and he, he said to me years later, I could have kissed that guy. When, as soon as he said that, that took off all the pressure. It wasn't him reporting to Nara that he's seeing flying saucers. It's Nara telling him, what do you got with you? And he said, well, there are two things here. Are they aircraft? Uh, I don't think so. They came in pretty fast, all that kind of stuff. And then um, do a a rotation, he does a rotation so they could figure out who was who on the radar and then eventually just at the point, as it actually coincided with the point where when um, Seamus thought that the objects were coming in too close, at that precise point when he thought it, these objects passed, moved away uh, and out to a, a greater di uh, distance away from the aircraft, thereby avoiding a collision. And then um, there was uh, the, the objects then passed in front of him and then took off 
and it said he felt that it left the plane as if it was standing still. Now at that point, the Sea Fury was one of the fastest planes in Australian skies. It was about to be replaced by the Sabres. Now there's been a theory that this was an example of two Sabres coming up and giving the naval pilot a scare. Now, when I put that to, to Seamus, you know, he just, you've got to be kidding. You know, like, uh, number one, uh, the Sabres were coming off the manufacturing line. They were British based and all that kind of stuff. And uh, they were building them. And there were only a couple of prototypes in the air. And the last thing that anybody would have done was to endanger this brand new jet aircraft. And the only time it would have come remotely close to the speed of what Seamus O'Farrell reported was if they were going into a huge dive at maximum speed. Then it would come within about a, uh, somewhere close to it, but not quite as fast. But these things were going from what was to him like a standing start and then, then taking off at high velocity and, and leaving his plane as if it was standing still. Very dramatic report. And, uh, but Turner didn't get to see that because he's off on a boat uh, heading towards England, writing his secret report about flying saucers and recommending that there should be more radar cases. Uh, and he, he writes his report, gets sent back, uh, and then the report's kept in the archives. Yeah? We, we can't have that coming out, whatever, whatever the attitude was, so bang. Next. Uh, more about Seamus. Seamus was kind enough to come along to my book launch of the Oz Files and, and like a typical writer you talk about it was a dark and stormy night. Well that night at the State Library was a dark and stormy night. So it was amazing that Seamus came along and there was only a limited number of people there but because it was one of the worst storms to hit Sydney for quite a while and it took, when I left the library to get home, it took me hours to get home. So much debris, fallen trees and all that kind of stuff. So, it was really nice to have Seamus there promoting uh, the, the book launch, that kind of thing. And uh, next, the Sea Fury, next. Uh, I've repeated that again, next. Uh, the Radar Operators Report. So th these are frames from, you can see this on YouTube, the episode of The Extraordinary where they're doing a recreation of this thing. They found the only functioning Sea Fury aircraft and got that and did their filming and all the rest of it. They brought me on board to check some of the facts and I said, ah, oh, guys, you're there talking about the wrong date. You got the date wrong. <laughs> they're recording it as December and it, met, it happened in late August. And they're extraordinary, went to extraordinary effort for accuracy, as it turned out. They literally refilmed the interview and got, Seamus had got it wrong too because uh, that's understandable because he was looking at it over the passage of time um, and eventually um, it only leaked out into the public eye in December of 1954, uh, literally four or five months after it happened. And here's the Minister for the Navy visiting Nara Naval Station and there'd been a leak. And instead of asking about whatever the uh, Minister of the Navy was wanting to promote during that visit to the base, all the reporters were saying, what's this about the flying saucers? Yeah, flying saucer, you know, radar, naval pilot. And the, and the minister's saying, what? It's kind of like, why wasn't I told? You know? And then it turned out to be he wasn't, hadn't been fully briefed and the report comes out and it, and it leaks. And it, and it was a major story across Australian newspapers of this naval pilot witnessing a UFO tracked on radar. Um, but unfortunately the timing was such that it didn't get reported or included in Harry's report, but it went to the heart of one of his major recommendations and that was get more radar data. Um, next. And that's just a, um, the director of naval intelligence. Uh, and that's where I got my copy of the reports from was the, the current then head in, in the early 80s, uh, the director of naval intelligence I asked for a copy, they went off and found it and, and uh, sent me a copy of, of this file. Um, but back in the day, 
DNI, that's the Director of Naval Intelligence, did a confidential endorsement of O'Farrell as being a, a very credible witness, um, that kind of thing. Next. Now, one of the things that Harry told me, to, talking about radar cases, and we'll, we'll finish and go for a break, I think. I'm looking around and seeing people might want a break, but yeah, must be my monotonous voice, but anyway. Um, Harry told me that um, the very famous July 1952 radar visual sightings over Washington, D.C., there was a special witness uh, that nobody knew about. And I certainly didn't know about it at the time until he told me. And that was that uh, these, were, these sightings caused such consternation that it led to the biggest peacetime press conference in American military history uh, when the, 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 the Pentagon was being besieged by uh, reports about what happened in the preceding weeks. Uh, on two weekends, consecutive weekends, a lot of, they tried to put it down to um, sort of temperature inversion, all sorts of weather phenomena and whatever, but uh, jet planes were sent up in pursuit of whatever was uh, they were tracking on radar, they sometimes saw lights and, and they tried to go in pursuit and, and, it, and it, whatever it was evaded their attention. And, uh, but sitting in the room, in the radar room on both Saturdays, consecutive Saturday, was this guy, you can see a picture of him, Colonel Richard Durance. He was the head of the Woomera Range uh, during the 1950s. Uh, particular, uh, particularly to the latter part, um, or for, for the early British rocket tests, and he's sent across to Washington. Now, this uh, report here um, in the uh, history of the rocket tests in Australia says that he was sent across in 1954, but he was there in 1952. No, sorry, sent across in 1953, and he was there during 1952 getting briefings and stuff like that with, from the likes of the CIA and all that kind of stuff. So he was briefed in and for whatever reason he was allowed to be present in the radar room on the Saturday, both, both Saturdays. And for the early part, before the UFOs appeared, uh, they were, the media were actually allowed in the room on the first weekend. They were locked out the second weekend. Um, but Durance was there uh, for both weekends. And I, I'm, these are my notes. Um, he possibly knew someone. He was invited into the Washington Tower. Um, uh, several screens working. He was absolutely convinced, not our sides. In other words, beyond known defence capabilities. He went to both sessions. Saturday, the first night, fairly open, limited. Um, and uh, uh, then the second night, it was embargo. That meant that only people with classification were allowed into that radar room on that weekend. And he was indeed, uh, uh, he was indeed, well, he was classed as an outsider, but because he had his security briefing, for some reason, they let him in. Um, but in the interview, let's just swap and we'll do this, and this will be the last thing we do before a break. Um, so the time stamp would be 32 minutes or thereabouts. Yeah, that'll do it. Interesting. Um, it, it's sort of a um, you know, real childish sort of way. Yep. That's how the security worked in those days. Yeah. Well, uh, when you were at uh, Maralinga um, and you were the Chelsea, Chief Health Physics uh, Officer there. Mm. What were your tasks involved in those days? Well, the main thing was to ensure that uh, we, we had about 2,000 square miles of territory that was uh, under our control. And I had to um, ensure that not only uh, were, were the, there were something like 2,000 people at some stage on the range itself, and I not only had to look after those 2,000 people, but also all the uh, station owners and um, Aboriginals on the outskirts of the, uh, of the territory. 
because the Woomera, the Woomera and Maragoga territories were adjacent to one another. Uh, so uh, I used to have to travel around as well. Uh, but the, the essential thing was to know what the radiation fallout was, uh, how much of it, what kind it was, uh, and also to take, undertake some sort of protection devices. Uh, this may involve just building fences or uh, covering up with a bulldozer. Or, uh, the vehicles that entered, they had to be looked after and all sorts of stuff. And we had materials being buried at the airfield, so they had a, 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 a cemetery. Um, to look after the cemetery. The cemetery is where they buried the, the radiated tanks and vehicles? They buried them in the cemetery? Not research, but I had an interesting um, interlude with the range commander, a chap named Dick Durance. Dick Durance. Uh, who um, had previously been the army attaché in Washington at the time of the July sightings, the Washington sightings. And for the, uh, there was two second, two consecutive Saturday nights. And the second Saturday night, he'd been asked up to, um, into the radar room to, uh, to see the thing. And he was totally impressed and totally convinced. So Durant was actually in the radar room during the Washington flight. Yeah. 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 It was a really interesting from that point of view. I think Durant had his own sightings at either Marion or Warner as well, I think. Not, not really. Uh, there, there was never any proper statement in this direction. Right. Uh, the, what amounted to was that some people down at the airfield, which is about a couple of miles from the camp, this uh, is uh, Maralinga. They claimed that they saw something, uh, and uh, it was sort of abandoned. The, the range commander probably heard about what these people claimed they saw. There's a guy in the background doing chainsaw work. Thank you, Mr. Turner. We'll just pause for a minute. Later, his wife comes out and does the washing in the background. <laughs> uh. Mr. Turner, we'll see if we can get back to it. We've, so, take, we've taken the chainsaw man out and got rid of him. We're, we're, we're talking uh, principally about Durant's. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, he he was very impressed with this. Uh, this did, did he talk directly to you about? Oh yes, we we're you know, you know, like just across the desk here. Yeah. yeah. So what what did he have to say about the Washington sightings? Well, as I said, it, it convinced him. He was uh, absolutely positive that these were something that was right. uh, real, and. Uh, I don't know how much he knew about radar. He didn't say anything about that. Uh, as a, probably as an army man like that, he probably didn't know much about it. Right. But um, he uh, he had uh, sort of trained people with him because mm -hmm. there are a number of uh, uh, PPIs, I presume they could still call them PPIs in those days. Yeah. Um, PPI stands for Planned of, Position uh, Indicator. Sharing. He was in it for hours long, many hours. So he would have had time to discuss it with a lot of people. Right. This is a time when the newspaper people were kept out. The first Saturday night, the, uh, uh, the media was allowed in, strangely enough. Mm. Um, the second time, they were kept out on some pretext. Uh, but uh, the military people had a clear go. Right. Well, did you want to yeah, yeah, I to clarify that Durant said, when he was talking to you about the Washington thing, did he volunteer anything about um, his awareness of, um, of uh, UFO activity in Australia at that time that he might have been privy to? No, no he, didn't, uh, he didn't go outside Washington. Right. Uh, he, um, what about, though, you, know, you were talking to him in the context of what Maralinga, I take it. Mm. Did he volunteer anything about what might have been going on around Maralinga or, no. or Woomera? Or? No. No, it was purely, uh, purely discussed Washington. It was in the fairly early stages um, of, of Maralinga. And, uh, you, you, you were there, when, when was your first year at Maralinga? Um, 56, uh, I think it was August 56. Right, okay. Um, 
know, I think so. It was, it was about, a, uh, I think we started uh, firing around about October, I think. Right. Something like that. Yeah. Well, in uh, April of 1957, according to our record, anyway, the director of that. Yep. So, most American researchers aren't aware of the presence of Durant's um, in the radar room for the famous Washington sighting. So, I'm sure that's something that, you know, I've been asked by Ross Coltard and uh, to, sorry. Yeah, um, mate, whoops, technology. Yep, can we hear? Yep, okay. Um, most uh, American researchers won't be familiar with the fact that a uh, very credentialed army witness who ha also had his own military attaché people with him was in the radar room for the famous Washington DC radar visual sightings. Now, the general thrust of the American public reporting on it was that it was all about temperature inversions. Uh, it clearly wasn't. Uh, um, actually, if you want to just persist with that with a few, few more minutes, I think he gets to talk about what Durant's thought was going on. JIB, and Daffy asked them, uh, would they take over their role of collecting and investigating UFO reports? I think I got that bit right. But do you have any personal knowledge or comments you wanted to add about that? Well, um, well, again, my memory of these names, but as the head of the of uh, the scientific uh, the scientific attachment to defence. Uh, um, I can't think of his name. I remember George Barlow. Uh, Bob Mason. No, next one up. Bob Mason. No, no, that's in. That's in. Uh, the yeah, we'll, right. we'll kill it there for a moment. Yeah, he says somewhere in the interview um, uh, that uh, Durant had said that uh, the consensus was in the room, radar room, that whatever it was, was. The, oh, here we go again. Yep. Uh, uh, the consensus was in the radar room during the Washington DC sightings was that whatever it was, it was real and it defied gravity and that it almost appeared to be weightless uh, and that kind of thing and it was doing literally astonishing things way beyond uh, military technology of the day. So that was part of the reason why a year later the CIA convened the Robertson panel that led to the whole debunking history of UFOs, that UFOs and flying saucers were a waste of time, move on folks, nothing to see here. Meanwhile, undercover, the CIA, US Air Force and a lot of intelligence organisations around the world were heavily looking into the subject and there's no doubt about that. Now, if you want to look for a lot of the devil in the detail, get that book UFOs and Government. You can even get a cheaper version as an e-book, God forbid. But you can read the e-book e and read it all online. Um, but anyway, um, so on you go. Um, let's, let's go for a break and we'll continue the clandestine world. Do you want to mention about your book? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, before you all go, folks. Yeah. I'm, in, I'm currently... This interview... You want to switch that off, Matt? Oh, this interview is uh, the result of a, the beginnings of an archiving project because um, uh, the background of this uh, interview was that there were two cameras set up. One was set up by Dominic McNamara of the um, Disclosure Australia project, nothing to do with Stephen Greer's Disclosure project, but it was um, an Australian uh, only kind of project to look at government documents and government investigations of UFOs in Australia. They did a really good job. Um, now, as I, I've stressed before, this was a hard to set up interview and we got there and I thought, okay, Dominic will set up his camera, I'll set up my own. Because I looked at Dominic's list of questions and you're sure they were very good questions, but having been talking to Harry for over a decade prior to that, there were about a thousand other questions that I wanted him to get on on record, particularly Durant's statement, which I'd known about for quite some time. I wanted that on the video, which you've seen, it, he mentions it there. Um, there's nothing better than having it on video uh, saying that. Um, the problem was, I always assumed that the disclosure video would be available and eventually I'd get a copy of it, 
And I, I remember looking at my own video after it, seeing that it was pretty much okay. Um, and that was the end of the story. It went into, the, into my archive. And then uh, I, I tried to track down the disclosure video and it turns out that's lost. Uh, no, 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 nobody seems to know where that is. And then I thought, okay, I'll go back and find mine. And then I'm looking at it. My old video camera doesn't play anymore. I cannot look at it. I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of, of really cool interviews that I'm trying to uh, beat the beat the, the, the time barrier. Uh, and for those that have got lots of high eight videos at home, get them transferred. Whatever you do, get them transferred. But try not to use your own old video camera because that creates a lot of problems. Uh, do it through a professional mob. I'm using uh, a mob in Hornsby and based on the experience I've had to date, they're bloody good. Um, and uh, there were two parts of this video that I took with my camera and it was just meant to be a backup filming, you know. So while Dominic might have switched it off, I don't know, I wanted to get extra bits on there, particularly after the event, uh, Dominic leaves and, and Harry gives me all these files which I take back to the hotel room, I'm videoing them, uh, all that kind of stuff and uh, eventually I got to keep a lot of those files. Um, and get or take copies of them at the local library as well. Um, but the preservation of oral history is really important. You know, this kind of detail, you can see already that what it shows is that here's a guy who's within the military, defence scientists, lots of qualifications brought to the mystery of the UFOs, and nobody knows about him, you know, like it but he's discovering things that have been around for such a long time. Uh, but it's almost like if you listen to all the major players in today's, you, uh, I was about to say ufology, but in today's upology, almost as if you're apologising for the chamber terminology, with, but with uh, the current players, it's as if they're making all these discoveries and they've done it in the last decade. That's not true. It's been around for a long, long time and people like Turner have found many of these things. So that's going to come out in a, a bit better detail perhaps in a, hopefully a, a presentation that uh, Ross Colthart and myself and Bryce Sable will do on the Need to Know podcast. When that's going to happen, I have no idea, probably in the next few weeks. It, eh, you know, Ross was wanting to see these videos yesterday, but I sort of said, look, later, later, you know, well, next week sometime, <laughs> whatever. But th it... it, it it's an important video, but, but the point about high eights is you've got to do the transfer now. The player here, uh, what's his name? I'll give him a plug. Sydney DVD makers, they're based at Hornsby. Um, seem to me to be a lot cheaper than a lot of the other places, what they're doing. Uh, but he, he went into the detail of what's going on. He said he'd been in the game for 20 years and that the high eight videos are starting to degrade. There's a mould problem going on and that they do a non-camera transfer, um, but sometimes they slowly pull the tape out, and if it sticks or it's got spotting on it, it means that possibly that tape's gonna stick. And the second tape broke about three times during that transfer, but you can see where there's a odd few problems for a few seconds or a, uh, less than a minute in one case, but. Um, essentially the entire verbal part of the narrative is maintained and a few word dropouts here and there. But overall, my message is, if you've got high eight memories there that you love dearly, get them transferred, do it as quickly as possible, whatever, whatever it takes. Anybody out there with a good quality uh, camera that plays high eight, that, where the head's not dead and the, the motor's running, think about donating to me, <laughs> whatever, because I've got hundreds of videos I want to go through and it's about preserving the goals. Now, there's a lot of, well, it might be junk to you, but it's personally important to me, but I'm, I'm about trying to identify all the key interviews and trying to get that transferred. So think about it. But uh, for your own memories, for your own sake, don't wait too long to get it transferred. The new, well, the newer mini, what do they call them, mini DVs? Apparently they don't have a problem yet, but he's predicting that they're going to have a problem probably down the road. 
but not so much as the uh, high eights do. And VHSs, well, they're another story in themselves. Usually you can depend on your video player to destroy video, <laughs> VHS videos you know, through stretching and all that kind of stuff. So there you go. Uh, with these books, um, I've got a few prices on them, but very quickly, highly recommend that book. Two copies, uh, but I'm, I'm going to be selling those for about 25 bucks because they, they're a scarce thing. Um, highly recommended. Uh, Richard Hall, who was high up in the NICAP organisation, that's his kind of summary of the phenomenon. Uh, huge catalogue in the back of cases. Great book. Um, I knew Richard Hall, a uh, great researcher. Um, and that's be about 20. Um, Jordita Bruni, you know, she did the, one of the first major books on Reynolds from Forest. That'll be about 20. One of the pioneer researchers from Britain, Brinsley Little Poor Trench, uh, his take on the, the flying saucer story. A couple of books about the New Zealand UFO scene, the New Zealand Files by Peter Hassel, and uh, Murray Stott's book, uh, Aliens Over the Antipodes. They're both good books on the New Zealand scene principally. The old classic for a couple of bucks, Jacques. No, John Keel, Operation Trojan Horse, uh, had us all running around chasing uh, Mothman and, and windows and all that kind of stuff back in the 70s. And anybody familiar here with Warminster in England? Uh, major sort of window area of activity. Uh, this is the newspaper journalist that brought the, the Warminster window into public awareness, wrote a whole series of books. Uh, the Warminster Mystery was the first of them. This is where things got very weird for Arthur Shuttlewood, um, this particular book. And he calls it UFOs, Key to the New Age. Uh, pretty strange book, but uh, it's, a, it's a hardback and that's a rarity. Um, so it'd be about 20 bucks. So if you're interested, come, come and see us. And uh, please help me. I don't want to take any of these home if I can help it. <laughs> uh, at least I got rid of some of them already. Enjoy your break. Now, luckily, we managed to get Harry. You've seen the interview with Harry talking about the testimony of, of Richard Durant. And from a historical point of view, it's great that Harry says that he got this directly from Richard Durant across the table while he was at uh, Maralinga and Moomera. So um, these are images from the radar rooms. And you can, this one's from Pathé, the, the early... Do you ever... Well, most of you, a lot of you folks are too young to remember, but you used to be able to go to the cinema at one time and see two movies and a newsreel. And Pathé was one of the early news re re reading things. And uh, this is one of the earliest ones, 1952, Flying Saucers. And there's this breathless courage, uh, breath, breathless narrative on, on the Washington DC sightings and film probably taken on the first weekend in the radar room. Yeah. Okay, next. Got to keep them away. <laughs> yep. Now, this comes to the rather unpleasant side of things. That, and I'll only dwell on this a little bit. One of the Maralinga bomb tests. These are photographs of all the uh, atomic bomb tests that were taken on Australian soil. And thank you very much for the British government for detonating all those bombs. How, you know, we love you for doing that. We don't. You know, it's, it probably allowed the infiltration of radiation into the milk supply and all that kind of stuff. There was a tremendous amount of radiation across the continent, but I'm not going to uh, sort of dwell on that. But the thing about is you need to be aware that Harry Turner was the chief health physics officer at the Maralinga bomb trials. Now, that seems to imply some culpability, but it doesn't because basically they were part... Of, he was part of the Australian side of it and they were lit it was literally a British operation. It was very hard for outside American... Well, we were outsiders on our own soil uh, in a lot of those tests and uh, it's kind of sad. This thing here, I get a, a phone call from this lady and it's a, a letter that Harry wrote. Um, he'd gone to... Uh, uh, Watsonia train station and that's this lonely train stop out the middle of nowhere in South Australia and it's a service train stop 
to Maralinga and he's taking a holiday, heading back to home to Perth and the morning, the night before there'd been a party because everybody's celebrating Christmas coming, whatever, and uh, uh, everybody had a late night and the military officer told him the train's coming at such and such a time. And he hightails it the morning after to the train station and then he's really pissed off because <laughs> the train's coming an hour later and he thought could have spent another hour asleep, you know, and he's writing this letter to a potential girlfriend, I think, at the time, and he's describing in this letter, and it goes on for quite a number of pages, handwritten on very thin tissue paper, the kind of paper they used to reduce the postal rates back in the day, and he's drawing uh, appearances of what the bomb looked like in one of the, the recent tests. Uh, you know, and, and, and she was asking, do you think that's of historical significance? So I said, sure as hell is. Contact, the, you know, they, she wanted to sound out the, I think it's the Australian Museum. What's the one in based in Canberra, the cultural one? Anybody know? Nobody's in the culture? No? Nope. Well, okay. But they, they were fascinated with this, uh, this letter. I suspect they'll be even more interested in the video interview that we're, we're doing here. Um, but it's just a piece of archival history. It doesn't mention UFOs at all. It uh, um, written at the train stop and then as you get further and further through the letter while he's describing all the wildlife of Maralinga, the bomb tests and everything, the writing gets shakier and shakier because it's being written on the train heading back to Perth, you know. So this is the, the train line that goes uh, to the north of the Nullarbor, you know. It's a long train trip, pretty wild trip. Anyway, next. Right. Well, while he was there, and because everything was, as you as I previously said, was so compartmentalised, half the time you wouldn't know what's going on, you know, uh, a kilometre away from you because information was so compartmentalised. But Harry, in the files and the archives, there's a, a UFO report from WeWAC, which is where some of the minor trials were done at Maralinga. Uh, in actual fact, there's a book about the EMU field trials uh, that came out recently that highlights the fact that the WEWAC trials were often more dangerous than the actual uh, mushroom tests. Um, but uh, at WEWAC there was a UFO sighting by uh, uh, staffers there. And uh, here's an entry, Mr Oliver Harry Turner, health physics officer who possesses an inquiring mind. Uh, made an independent investigation and extensive calculations. He is of the opinion that the light seen at WeWAC was the result of a natural phenomenon, was not the result of a natural phenomenon, but caused by an unidentified flying object, either a cone from a satellite, and you've got to bear in mind this is 1960 at Maralinga, uh, or, or a flying saucer. <laughs> so that was his take on it. Of course, the intelligence officer, the security officer, Mr. Sergeant J.J. A. Hanlon, begged to differ. He knew better. And, and that it clearly was probably the light was caused as a result of either a meteor or static electricity. A hell of a meteor in this case. It's very striking. But it's an interesting story. You can read about the details in the archives. That's in a document called, or file called, Maralinga Project General Policy and administration, there are UFO files in there. So check it out on the, in the archives. Next. Right. Now, this is a, a pretty interesting document. You can access this in the archives. Now, um, we'll get... There's a bit of a narrative to this. This is called a, a D, is it this the DTO? Yeah, DSTO, um, and it's... Uh, a file about UFOs, mainly to do with a lot of the early days of Harry's work trying to get what was affectionately called, what was literally a rapid intervention team. He wanted a team of scientists armed with magnetometers to fly into a UFO landing case courtesy of an RWF jet that would be on standby as a rapid team to go and investigate UFOs. That's, and he, he, he got it up to the level of being approved 
by the head of defence science. They were all backing him and you'll find out what happened uh, in this. But this is a, uh, a story probably out of chronology but it, it, it tells you um, this is a letter from uh, F-A-S-S-I-P. Now, what the hell is that? I had to look it up myself. But uh, uh, that turns out to be a fellow by the name of Ross Thomas, 1981, First Assistant Secretary, Strategic and International Policy. Now, that's a pretty high-profile position. What the hell has that got to do with UFOs? Well, anyway, this is what... It talks about an unnumbered minute on the above title, that's investigation of unusual aerial sightings, that's the preferred term that the RAF use, UAS, not UAP, UAS. Um, thank you for the reference, which raises a matter. Uh, and this is written by G.F. Barlow, that's George Barlow. I interviewed him um, and he had a serious interest. He was the deputy head of defence science under, uh, who was the... I can't recollect the name of the chief scientist at that time. But uh, maybe it mentions here. But yeah, yeah, here we go. Thank you for the reference, which raises a matter which has been discussed with DSTO, that's Defence Science Technology Organisation, um, from time to time. Two previous chief defence scientists took an interest in the physical basis of the reported phenomena Phenomenas, and that oh here we are, Mr. Uh, H. A. Willis or oh, H. A. Wills actually, that's Arthur Wills. He was one of the chief defence scientists, uh, and the other scientist, chief defence scientist, was Dr. J. L. Farrens. Now, uh, in the public domain, Farrens is probably unfortunately best known as allegedly uh, giving our poor benighted um, Governor General John Kerr a briefing about uh, American secret bases in Australia, uh, which possibly led to the dismissal of the Whitlam government. Now, Farrens certainly would have been well informed about that topic, but he denies that he was the one that gave a briefing to the Governor-General about that dismissal or about, about the secret bases in Australia. Um, but uh, anyway, Farrens and Wills, Wills uh, they were, and DSTA was involved with JIO in the design of the form attached, that's the UFO form, that's the work of Harry Turner they're talking about there. Uh, in culling the forms held by the RAF, they're, they're, uh, what's it? there's a small core of reports which are completely re re competently reported and cannot be readily ascribed to astronomical objects. This is a, a secret restricted internal document that, that says that DSTO, JIO, Chief Defence Scientists, a couple of them, one after the other, were all interested in UFOs. This is exactly the story that Turner told me um, over the decades. Uh, so there's documentation there in the archives that confirms that. And uh, if they're contemplating this sort of stuff back in 1981. Uh, you can speculate about that. Uh, now, next. This is Dr John Farrens. Now, as I said, he was chief defence scientist um, and he, this is one of the public books that he wrote, Don't Panic, Panic, <laughs> The Use and Abuse of Science in, to Create Fear. Um, really interesting guy. Next. Now, I don't expect you to read all that, but... Uh, Basically, um, Seamus O'Farrell, the Sea Fury pilot, when he rose to the ranks from 1954 after, he didn't want people to know or to bring up the Flying Saucer sighting. Um, but he would regularly have lunch um, with a gentleman, Dr John Farrens, at the Russell offices where I went to look at the files back in the 80s. But he would regularly have, and this would be around the period of... Uh, uh, a little bit earlier than that. And uh, he'd regularly have lunch and Farrens would tell O'Farrell he knew it all. There, there, there was convincing evidence and all that kind of stuff. 
and, and it was O'Farrell that said, you ought to talk to John Farrens, uh, the chief defence scientist. Now here am I thinking, yeah, uh, ring up the chief defence scientist or ex-defence scientist, he he'll, wouldn't give me the time of day. Anyway, I did bring him and during November 1992, now I didn't expect to get much in the way of a confirmation of deep interest in the UFO phenomenon from a scientist with such deep and impressive defence credentials. Uh, but it went a little differently to what I expected. Uh, basically, um, I think I get into a bit. Um, he, was, he was the Australian Chief Defence Scientist from 1971 to 1977 and from 1977 to 1982 was the head of the Department of Science, the public side of things, non-military. Um, our conversations held many surprises. Dr. Farrens confirmed that he had a, a long interest in UFO reports. That's confirmed by that document in the archives. Um, he even had files, while I was talking to him on the phone, he had files that he accessed while, while we talked. And he, re he revealed to me a confirmation of the rapid intervention team that Turner had developed and gave a date and a time, said, go look for that, that memo. He had a copy of the memo. I have a feeling he had the original because I've never been able to find that particular file reference that he gave me. But, but the other file talks about it, you know, in general terms. Um, and that it, it basically said that... Uh, um, I give a date later on on that, the, the actual date, time and who was part of that team. And, and those were the, the defence scientists that I went after and I interviewed nearly every one of them and they all confirmed that story that, that they had this rapid intervention team on standby and it was all ready to go except for something that happened in 1969 which you'll find out in a moment. Okay, so next. Anyway, I found, found the conversation with John Farrens, it was like talking to a colleague, you know, he really opened up and he's gone backwards and forwards to his filing cabinet, pulling out files, look up this one, Bill, go there and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, beauty, I'm writing it all down. But the only one I couldn't find was that one that confirmed in great detail the, the team. Now, you might remember that Bob Mathams was Harry Turner's boss. He indicated to me uh, back in uh, that 1982 in a letter that uh, he's director of science, scientific and technical intelligence, that's DSTI, quote, had only a marginal interest in UFOs, our analytical resources were limited and I had to take the, opinion, the position that we could not afford to become too involved in investigation of UFO sightings until we had reasonable grounds for believing that they were of foreign as opposed to alien origin. We relied on Daffy, that's Director of Air Force Intelligence, um, uh, to uh, make the initial investigations at, at times uh, and we assisted in the interpretation of the resulting data. Now he also advised me in, in a subsequent letter that his interest as uh, director of Scientific and Technical Intelligence in UFO sightings was aroused only when there was sufficient evidence to suggest that they may have been connected with or caused by foreign scientific and or technological developments. There were only one or two that fitted that category. We never really decided uh, who would take responsibility for further investigation if it were shown convincingly that a UFO sighting in Australia was of extraterrestrial origin. That's what he says in this letter to me back in December of 82. Um, now this is part of one of the facilities that comes into this story, but I, I really haven't got time to go into detail. This is the, an aerial shot of the aeronautical research labs at Fisherman's Bend. Classic photo. I wished I'd been able to interview every one of those guys in this photo. I got to interview a few of them. Uh, John Farrens, Tom Keeble was interviewed by a few other people, Jack Dance and others, they're all key players. And what do they call this little gas gathering? These guys were called the ancient aeronauts. You know, they're, they're into aerospace, obviously, but uh, 
interesting title to this really high-powered military intelligence science group. Next. Right. Now, um, now Harry, I said earlier, had desi helped design the, the, the report form that the RWF, Air Force Intelligence, used for gathering data because he looked at the old report form and said, you'll never get scientific data that way. Let's revise the report form. But the problem was that they never really, the intelligence officers on the ground rarely used the report form in the way it should have been used uh, to gather key data. And every so often there'd be a really enthusiastic Air Force intelligence officer that would do a really good job and follow the procedures down to the letter. But they soon got that pressured out of them. It was basically a job. They weren't given the resources, and it was sort of a, a low priority thing, but here's Turner trying to gather data. Now, here's the, the letter, I think. Yeah, John Farron said, uh, Turner wrote in a memo dated November 8th, 1969, to the director of JIB, indicating that he had Dr Morton from ANU, that's the Australian National University, Dr John Simmons from the Australian Atomic Energy Commission. He was the guy that wrote the official report on the Maralinga bomb trials. Um, and I spoke to him as well, uh, John Simmons, um, and Dr Mike Duggan. Now, Dr Mike Duggan is a story of its own. Uh, he and Har Harry Turner joined forces and were doing these very intense private investigations of UFOs all across Australia. Now, I'll get into Mike Duggan again a little later, but and Mike Duggan was then with the National Standards Laboratory. George Barlow, who I also interviewed, um, he, of Defence Science and Technology, D DST, had offered to help Harry Turner's group. Um, Harry indicated that he had um, the Chief Defence Scientist of the day, uh, Arthur Wills, had agreed to this, that, that the, there had been agreement and support from defence scientists that this rapid intervention team would go forward and be ready. Unfortunately, uh, in the middle of 1969, a major UFO flap broke out in Western Australia and the RWF uh, intelligence officer who was required to do the investigations was out of his depth, totally swamped by UFO reports coming in and a call went out to headquarters of the DAFI in Canberra, we need help. There are so many UFO sightings and what wasn't clear was that the intel officer in most cases had to investigate flying saucer sightings, UFO sightings on his own time and not without any material assistance from the Department of Defence. Had to be his own car, all this kind of stuff. Sorry. Here we go. <coughs> Technology. It's good stuff, isn't it? Always fails. Yeah, but anyway. Um, now, basically, um, the guys on the ground, irrespective of whether they had enthusiasm, and, and some did, and this guy did in, in Perth at, um, uh, at Pierce Air Force Base, he was keen, but he didn't have the resources. Um, no, he had to use his own car, his own money to investigate UFO reports. You know, like, it was a crazy situation. Now, when he, he put, the word went out from the head of Pierce that they're being inundated with, with reports and we can't keep up with it all. Um, at that time, Harry Turner had just about finalised his rapid intervention team and uh, the word went out, Perth guys need help. So they requested Harry Turner to go, go to Perth and investigate. And one of the most interesting sightings was another radar visual report. And as I've pointed out earlier, Harry had expertise in the early development of radar in Australia. So perfect scientists to send to do this investigation. And they were investigating a lot of different reports, but this is the one that stood out for him, the Kalamunda radar observation. Now, it just so happened that Mrs C, her name is in, publicly available in the archives, but at the time I, I wrote this, her name wasn't, but um, uh, she had reported her husband worked in air traffic control 
at Cloverdale, at, at Kalamunda. And uh, she rang into the uh, air traffic control officer and said, there's a UFO hovering over Cloverdale. Can you get my husband and whatever onto it? And, the, and they're tracking it on radar. It's hovering. And they had uh, a, uh, what they call a moving target uh, indicator, which was designed to eliminate stationary objects from the radar coverage. And yet this object was coming up on the radar and it's sitting there. And according, uh, apparently, according to Turner, it was doing rapid movements backwards and forwards. Where have we heard that before or more recently? The tic-tac, zip, 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 zip across the water going backwards and forwards. This was doing that then in 1969 and Turner, looking at the data, the radar data, made that conclusion that this object was oscillating really quickly, backwards and forwards for some reason. That's why the only reason it could have been picked up on the uh, moving target indicator of the, of the radar that was being used. Uh, it had to be moving rapidly on its own axis at the time. So whatever it was. Anyway, so to him that was a very impressive sighting. Um, now he says that uh, uh, Neither the Kalamunda radar observation nor Mrs. C's sighting can be readily explained by conventional objects or phenomena. This is an internal report, by the way. His report also in part, unfortunately, in retrospect, criticised the lack of support that the uh, RWF and Daffy gave to their own intelligence people on the ground. And he was quite critical of the process. You know, he had to borrow, beg, just to get facilities to go around and do all these investigations. And, in, and then in the end, uh, that report had to get circulated through the Director of Air Force Intelligence back in Canberra. And what did he do? This is Ralston, by the way, uh, the guy involved. He just shut off Turner's access to Air Force cases and shut off JOB's or JOO's access to uh, RWF files and basically was basically get stuff, don't be a critic. Everything at that time was under um, review. The whole defence intelligence empire was under a huge state of flux. And even though the director of Air Force Intelligence hated UFOs, didn't want to borrow it, wanted to get rid of it, at this point in time he wanted to keep it. And he didn't like outsiders, and that outsider in this case was Turner and the Joint Intelligence Organisation. You'd think they'd be working together. Where have we heard this before? What happened in September 11? All the intelligence departments in the United States weren't talking to each other. Too much compartmentalisation. What? You're sending me a message? No? It's all right. I was going to say, hurry up, look at the time. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, cool. Um, anyway, um, unfortunately, uh, what Harry... Turner had thought was going to be good advice to improve the capture of information about UFOs was completely uh, used in a different way to basically stop anybody else from doing any serious research within defence science. Uh, all because um, defence or Air Force intelligence did not want to lose that part of their empire. Because uh, you've got to understand that within the military hierarchy, the more you had to have in terms of responsibility, the more you progress through the upper hierarchy. And if you lose part of your empire, even if you don't want that empire, that part of the empire, you want to get rid of it, you hang on to it during those critical times so that you can progress and, and rise up through the, the ranks, so to speak. That's the story that Turner gave me as to explaining why this happened. Now, he wasn't a politician, he wasn't a military guy, he was a scientist trying to gather information about UFOs. But, you know, unfortunately, I think he lacked a little bit of uh, trying to understand the military brain, you know, um, what's going on there, that kind of thing. Anyway, the upshot of it was Harry Turner's access to the Daffy UFO files withdrawn. Next. Kalamunda, that's uh, uh, tracings of the radar case. This is, uh, unfortunately, you can't see it too well, but. When I originally took this shot, Harry had given me his file on the Kalamunda case. I'm back at the hotel after we'd done the disclosure interview and um, 
Dominic had already left, I think, and I'm there in my hotel room taking photographs of documents because I didn't think I'd see them again. But I managed to get most of this stuff later on, but um, it's got all these... It was a really detailed report on the Kalamunda case, but I just wished he hadn't attached the critiquing of uh, the role of Air Force intelligence on the ground. If that had not been part of the report, we might have progressed further, you know, but as it was, it got killed off. Um, yeah, and that's just the uh, radar guys making reference to it, saying it was a very large return and uh, it was the size of a large jet and yet it was capable of being picked up on radar designed to cut out stationary hovering objects because jet aircraft don't hover. So we need to eliminate anything that does hover, uh, that kind of stuff. That's the nature of the radar that's used. Um, so if you see anything flying into Sydney Airport and it's, it's hovering, it probably won't get picked up <laughs> unless it's moving around a bit, um, that kind of thing. Um, next. Now, earlier I was talking about Dr Mike Duggan. Now, Dr Mike Duggan and Harry Turner turned out to be long-term friends. They were working with each other, doing a lot of field investigations. During the 1966, oh, sorry, 1969 wave in Perth, this was one of the more controversial sightings that leaked out. I saw coverage of it on Current Affair. Uh, and to me, I looked at it, uh, here's a guy with his wife, apparently, having a close encounter, taking photographs, multiple photographs, Polaroids, um, and capturing them. And at one stage, he's taking them in quick succession. He's smoking at the same time, drops his cigarette, and somehow the cigarette falls on one of the images right at the point where the, the UFO appears, but it appears in other photographs. Now, I, I kind of thought, hmm, probably could be a hoax, you know, but I saw the interview and I thought it was a re really interesting story, but as it turns out, buried away in the RWF files was another witness and it never got thoroughly investigated, although the intel officer, as I said, was enthusiastic, doing this on his own time, investigated this Diane Martin, her account. She's driving along. She sees this guy running out of the bush with a camera, throwing stuff on the ground and in a state of panic and looking back and pointing. And she looks up to where he's pointing and she sees this, this object up in the sky. So that, t the intel officer says that she was a really credible witness, but nobody else investigated it at the time in detail. Harry didn't know about that detail to begin with until years later. They tried to find her, but they certainly found uh, Mr. Spackman, Peter Spackman. Trying to find either Spackman or Martin proved almost impossible. You know, we were using a lot of things to try and track them down. But probably we've got what appears to be a, I don't know, it looked to me like a hubcap thrown up in the air. But according to Duggan, uh, it's apparently a, a highly credible photo. Now, Duggan, years later, decades later, uh, ended up working at DARPA at Kirtland Air Force Base in the United States. And I interviewed him while he was at the University of Pittsburgh before he went to DARPA. When he went to DARPA, nobody could find him. He went under the radar big time. And when he died, he was still working for DARPA at the age of 80, must have been a fairly important guy working on photographic intelligence gathering of high altitude objects in space. And when he died, there was a certain person that wrote in the, uh, the funeral book a tribute, and that was Dr. Oh, sorry, General McCaslin. Now, that name is the name given to the general that guys like uh, the rock star <laughs> Tom DeLong was having conversations with this general, the general, and that was General James McCaslin. And here's McCaslin writing a tribute piece to Dr. Michael Duggan for all the wonderful work that he's done over the decades for DARPA and the US Air Force. So a very interesting guy, uh, Mike Duggan. On my website, I've got a tribute piece to Mike Duggan, so you can read a lot more detail about Duggan there. Next. What have I got here? Uh, 
Yeah, that's more, just a general statement of stuff, feedback. Uh, Dr. Farrens, one of the things, apart from talking to him on the phone and he's pulling out UFO files that he'd kept, and I was trying to think, are they originals or copies or whatever, and why has he got these files at home, all that kind of stuff. And then he surprised me by saying, well, Bill, I was going to write a book on UFOs. Um, I said, seriously? Yeah. And he said, yeah, 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 I'm really interested. It's a, it's a really interesting scientific problem. Um, and he says, I'm not going to write it now. I'll wait for your book. And I said, no, 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 no. write your book. <laughs> you know, I'd love to see it. But unfortunately, uh, when my book came out a, a year or so later, uh, he passed away about a month after my book came out. So I never knew whether he had uh, access or to the book or whatever. I, I doubt it. But... Uh, yeah, really interesting guy. Uh, wish we knew everything that kind of happened uh, un un under the radar, so to speak. But um, uh, John Farron's archives, you can access part of it, uh, but lots of it you need a security clearance to access it, and I don't have a security clearance. So, um, so there, there are issues there that I'd like to find out a little bit more deeply about what Farron's had and what he learnt and all that kind of stuff. Uh, during his time. But when you compare this level of activity, high level activity to the highest position within defence scientists back then under, as that memo said, two consecutive um, directors of defence science, uh, fascinated and almost obsessed about UFOs. And what's the story today in Australia? Not interested. Don't want to know about the U UAPs. Don't I want to know about what's happening with the United States Air Force, their obsession with UFOs? It's not an issue. Uh, no, we don't even encourage our own pilots to report them other than through the normal air safety investigation reports, etc. You know, it's clearly either head in the sand type of uh, approach to the problem or something else is not going on and we're not on a need to know basis. I suspect the latter. Um, but fortunately, there are active people that are actively pursuing FOI requests that will only get you so far, but people like Grant Levesque from Melbourne actively doing stuff, and uh, I, I admire his tenacity <laughs> under a lot of great deal of difficulty. Um, um, there was a conference, was it last year or the year before, Defence Science Conference, held at Darling Harbour, and a key, couple of key people who were part of the briefing to uh, defence, uh, the head of defence uh, on UAPs and it took a while to drag that confirmation out of them and eventually Grant was able to get a copy of the briefing and it had various names, a lot of them were blacked out but a couple of key names were going to be presenting at that defence science conference. And uh, originally a friend of mine who works in a certain position I can't identify in Northern Territory. Um, he was going to go, he couldn't go. Uh, then he suggested Ross. Ross was clearing off to the United States to do it. And then he asked me, do I want to go? And I said, God, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I wanted to interview those guys that were on that briefing document. And uh, oddly enough, they were a no-show on the day. Um, and that seems surprising, but we've been trying to get confirmation of what, what informed their understanding of how they consulted on that briefing document to the Chief of Air Staff. And that document came up because of Senate estimates inquiries by the Green Senator, Wish Wilson from Tasmania. It's the only reason we know about it, is that it came up in the defence estimates, you know, and Grant went after the Freedom of Information thing to try and get the detail of how the Chief of Air Staff would be briefed. But it's like going back to the Stone Age, trying to get data out of the current Department of Defence. It's a real brick wall, heavily compartmentalised, but a lot of the trail seems to go back to, guess what, Space Command. Remember that document from 1981 that talked about the Space Office? I didn't even know we had a Space Office in Australia back in 1981, but now it's a big grand third wing, fourth wing of the Australian Defence, um, the Space Office. wonder what's going on. Uh, I'd like to know, but maybe we're not on a need-to-know basis, so interesting. Um, 
Next. There we go. Yeah, we're into the into the last stretch. You know. um, this is the very controversial uh, and often highly misinterpreted JIO document, originally classified secret, and it's held for historical reasons allegedly, according to the JIO. But it's mostly mainly Harry Turner stuff, uh, full of Harry Turner's efforts to try and get a rapid intervention team going. Uh, here's Harry Turner saying. The two documents attached are intended to uh, focus on aspects of the UFO problem that have tended to remain hidden. Um, the report dealing with the um, uh, US attitude has been compiled from official reports and statements made by the CIA. Uh, US Air Force congressional hearings and Project Blue Book records. The second document deals with evidence for weapon systems used by UFOs. Mm. Weapons. What kind of weapons? Paralysis, you name it. Beams of light, paralysis cases, cases of mortality, all that kind of stuff. Now, unfortunately, Harry didn't take all that data from official records. He got it from Jacques Vallée's Magonia catalogue that was published in 1960. In, in in the, in the classic book, Passport to Magonia. Don't buy the British edition because it completely removed that catalogue. The US edition has the full catalogue, you know, and, and it's really just a start. You know, uh, it, there's thousands of more cases that are into that kind of thing. But um, now, it does say here, this evidence is being culled from computerised reports collected by Dr. Vallee in collaboration with Dr. Heineck at Northwestern University and represents only a fraction of worldwide reports dealing with the same weapon systems. Australia has had its share of this kind of reporting. Two, intelligence aspects include assessment of real uh, from false reporting, capabilities for propulsion methods and possible weapons used. Uh, Motivation of operations, bracket harmful or not, defensive, offensive, scientific, etc., from both uh, short term and long term, and whether there are more effective ways to detect these operations or defend them if necessary. This is coming from O.H. Turner, head of the nuclear branch of Joint Intelligence Organisation. Now, when I looked at all the stuff that Harry had in his files, it looked as though he spent a lot of time trying to get the head of JIO and Defence Science to get serious about UFOs. The story gets even better as it goes on. Um, next. Um, in that document, he talks about Harry's reference. This is where uh, Ross had sort of perhaps interpreted this as a crash retrieval program, but it's not quite, not quite there reference to a crash program into anti-gravity power. Now, it, it talks about the context of that, that during the 50s there was this crash program to bring together all sorts of scientific defence and intelligence resources to study the concept of anti-gravity. Why? You know? uh, the, the thing about Turner is uh, he became aware internally at Harwell at the Atomic Research Establishment in the UK a notice came up advertising for scientists and others to work in this crash program. And uh, the problem, most scientists looked at that document and thought, what do you mean crash program to study anti-gravity? We don't even understand gravity. We've got to understand gravity first and then we'll understand anti-gravity. But then, uh, and there was all that kind of t going on. But uh, that whole pro program sort of was very high profile within defence circles and then went dark after a while, and we wonder what happened, uh, basically. Next. This is all coming from a document within the Joint Intelligence Files, which you can now go and have a look at in our National Archives within the Joint Intelligence Organisation. What does it mean? Does it represent the official view of J.O.? No. It represents mainly the view brought together by somebody who was very carefully looking at the problem, but even his own bosses really didn't want to know. 
They're, they're too under-resourced to look at the problem. But it talks about all these different organisations that were involved, um, some were quite well known, um, and then he's wondering why was there such an intensive program to develop this, you know, and the, the implication may be there was something more to it, that it was kind of like a part of a retrieval program, but the evidence is not quite there in black and white. Next. Uh, here's part of the uh, Harry Turner's usage of Jacques Vallée's Magonia catalogue on these landing reports. It was had a thousand cases in that listing. Um, I think it was a thousand, something of that nature. But he's going through specifically looking for uh, stalled car events, the ability for cars to be immobilised, you know, like it's like some sort of hypothesised electromagnetic weapon. So he's talking at it in the context of military intelligence, you know, trying to get them interested in it from their perspective. But next. Um, now, what was Harry Turner's conclusions? If Australia is to follow the US lead, uh, then instead of following the public US Air Force attitude, that's what the general public knows about, it would be preferable to follow the US Air Force slash CIA role of con concentrating on gaining a knowledge of the power sources involved. What that means is that he was aware that there was a public story and a secret story. And the secret story was they were, they were trying to figure out what was the power source behind UFOs. Uh, not something that the CIA or the US Air Force would publicly acknowledge. Anyway, however, it may be preferable to act independently of the US and initiate a program that is scientifically sound and intellectually honest towards unravelling the UFO mystery. In such a venture, it may be worthwhile working somewhat closer to the public than is usual in the US and UK. In other words, an open and transparent scientific investigation, bringing the public on board and using the resources of the defence and all that in defence science. But he knew that there was a campaign to kill all that stone dead. Um, so almost like a lone warrior, he had chief defence scientists, people on, on board, but they were all mindful of if they kept pushing this, they were going to get locked out of their own programs, that kind of thing. So next. Uh, and this is a bit of the aftermath and the, the debate within the hierarchy of... Uh, Defence Science and JAO ultimately it came down to the fact that, yeah, we haven't got enough resources and, and nobody's interested. And besides that, we've got bigger fish to fry, whatever. Um, in the end, it wasn't formally put into play as far as we know. Next. Um, now, to, to really give you an idea, and I can not possibly cover all of the complexity of what Harry Turner did over the decades. But if you have a read of my book, Hair of the Alien, there's one chapter in there about an early uh, alien odyssey or something of that nature. And it's all about a file that Harry Turner gave to me, handed it over, a ten, I think it was 10 pages or something, and it was all to do with a woman that he was researching and investigating who happened to be the secretary of the Civilian UFO Group in Canberra. Vicky Klein. Now I'd spoken to her on the phone, I didn't know any of this. As it turned out, she kept it quiet because it wasn't UFOs up in the sky, this was something that was happening in her home and to her personally and she didn't want to share that even with her own UFO group. It was such an intense experience and I can't do justice to it in a few minutes. But it, uh, what's really crazy and bizarre is that some of the experiences correlated with some, I've got to say, some of the weirder experiences of coming, out, what came out of the Skimwalker Ranch. And I'm talking the really weird stuff, uh, like encounters with walking bipedal wolfmen, that kind of stuff. You kind of think, that's just so crazy, you, you, you can't really easily believe in it. And yet, here, in this document, Harry handed to me this account of Vicky, Vicky Klein and her experience and 
she was encountering, uh, uh, well, the amazing thing for me was that that document in 1971 highlighted the whole abduction narrative as we've started to understand it, but that understanding only came decades later with people like Bud Hopkins and others, and you can agree to disagree with whatever these takes are. But the nature of what was going on in the abduction phenomenon was being defined in Vicky Klein's experience in Canberra and later at Dalton. Dalton is this little village outside of Canberra that is the most earthquake prone area in all of Australia. Uh, there are more earthquakes there and the general takeaway line with folks when you meet them in Dalton is if you don't like the scenery stick around because the scenery out your window will change. <laughs> the earth moves you know, <laughs> and it moves quite a bit and, ha and actually for a while Vicky Klein was sending us reports to my group about she was like the local earthquake monitor in Dalton and sending reports to the head of the seismological office in uh, Canberra and also to our group UFOIC in Sydney. And there was all this bizarre phenomena going on, UFO related, um, very strange phenomena going on. But, it, but she was, had developed her own way of predicting earthquakes coming courtesy of particularly effects on animals and stuff like this. And this is something that's been picked up by a lot of people all around the world later. And I made the friendship of, uh, ultimately later, of uh, a Dr. Marion Lieber, Lieber, Marion Lieber, sorry, um, who was the key contact point for Vicky Klein to send all her earthquake monitoring reports. She had her own seismometers and everything uh, around her house monitoring the earthquakes and, that, and that, those reports go to Marion. And Marion Lieber and Vicky Klein became firm friends and yet during that time she never ever said anything to Marion about, uh, this is Dr Marion Lieber, about the UFOs and the aliens, the allegedly the aliens that turn up in the house, the aliens that somehow had some sort of direct a powerful relationship with a, who's that? No, never mind. Okay. Um, but basically um, there was this contact experience going on in the house and there's one extraordinary element that, that's revealed. Go to the next slide. Here we go. Here we go. Now, this is straight from Turner's account of Vicky Klein. Uh, the neighbour, Mrs Z, claimed that during the evening of September 7th, 1971, she had gone to the rear of the house because her dog was playing up. Turner's notes state, Quote, as the dog retreated indoors, she noted two figures in Mrs Klein's backyard near a tree. Mrs Z thought they must be Mr and Mrs Klein, but was puzzled as to why they should be standing in that position and being so still. So she went towards them and shone her torch on them. They turned out to be a tall, metal meshed clad figure. And this figure was, he says, Claude. Now, Claude was the entity that somehow was interacting with Vicky Klein inside her house all the time. The entity, uh, 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 but Vicky hadn't told a neighbour yet about what was going on. And, and it had a, a dog-like face. Uh, and they were smiling at her as though a joke was being played on her. And then they gradually just faded away in the backyard in front of her. And she's saying, what? You know? And then she started talking to Vicky. And Vicky starts to reveal a story to her. And she's going, what? <laughs> and then she becomes subject to the same experiences that Vicky was having at a really intense level. Abductions, contact. Uh, it was really bizarre. The detail is all in that one chapter. Uh, and, um, and then apparently during that time, uh, there were no signs left behind uh, 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 or physical evidence. Mrs Klein's dog was not disturbed. <laughs> this is Vicky Klein when she appeared on the science program on the ABC in 1988. She's talking all about earthquake predictions. Nothing related to UFOs and she was seen as an authority. I turn up at Dr Marion Lieber's place and I become firm friends with her and her son 
and uh, she uh, loved Vicky Klein. Uh, they were firm friends, and she knew nothing about the story I told her. And she said, unbelievably, she trusted Vicky so much that she felt that it had to be true. And at the funeral of Vicky Klein, um, she gives a, 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 an address, you know, to see her off. And right at that time, there's an earthquake swarm. And, and, and she thought, ooh, I wonder if that's Vicky talking to us, you know, <laughs> predicting another earthquake. You know, that's how she felt. The, the friendship was so strong. Um, but next, uh, this is a bit more about the public side of Vicky Klein. Now, what was involved in the private side were multiple UFO stories, UFO detector sightings, aliens in the house, poltergeist, an early alien abduction odyssey, an alien child, an alien hybrid program, apocalyptic prophecy. Vicky and her neighbours shared an identical abduction contact uh, uh, Milu, a witnessed UFO contact Milu, a complex and rewarding investigation. Now, uh, unfortunately, by the time that I became aware of this, Vicky had died from brain hemorrhage. Uh, very young age, but her children were alive, husband was alive, father was alive. I interviewed all of those people. And uh, one of the sons who became the subject of a claim that he was an alien hybrid kind of thanked me that I didn't uh, come to him knocking on the door asking for a sample of his hair. I said, I thought about it, but, uh, but um, to me he seemed to be quite humid and shared, shared I don't think he was an alien hybrid. This, it's hard to know, but it was a complex story. Uh, but read about it in the, in the book if you like, I wanted to know the detail. Um, and here's Harry's further notes. These two disparate types claim they are one people. The tall blonde one is similar to the Nordic race, but the dog-faced one has pointed ears, eyes with large pupils, no iris, or is it no white, Turner says. Longish flattened face, nose, thin mouth, dressed in blue-grey tunic with tight banded collar and oval shoes, question mark. Dog face type can appear to look more human-like if they wish to. Uh, they're swarthy looking, five feet, five foot six uh, in height. And you're thinking, whoa, this is a big shift away from radar sightings and all that kind of stuff, heavy duty stuff. Next. But if you look at this book written by insiders um, from the Defence Intelligence Agency, James Lakatsky, um, he the, was the D Defence Intelligence Agency's uh, connection with the Skinwalker Ranch. He goes to Bigelow's Ranch for the first time. He, he's gone through Harry Reid, the Senate Majority Leader at the time, um, wanting to, uh, this is an official inquiry, they want to look at what's going on at Skinwalker Ranch. He arrives there and on the first day he's there, he's been looking around the ranch and he's sitting there and this weird object appears in the, in the, the ranch room and, he's, and he realises that nobody else can see it. And there's Bigelow there and others and it's like this, if you've seen the cover of the, the um, music uh, record, record um, Tubular Bells, this metallic looking shape is there. That's the closest that he could come to and he's thinking, oh, here am I. Uh, heavily into rockets and missiles and defence investigations. I've never had a psychic experience in my life. I arrive at the Skinwalker Ranch and this is happening to me. He, and he immediately goes back and thinks, we've got to look into this. Whatever it was, he thought was messing with his mind and he immediately goes to defence significance. What is this? What, if this is doing this to me, basically a psychic block of wood, no, no psychic ability, he thought. What can it do to pilots? All that. That's the kind of thought narrative I suspect was going on in Lukatsky's head. Now, you know that this thing, uh, Lukatsky talks about coming back and there, and there was also, um, they launched this full funded DIA investigation at Skinwalker Ranch and it looks as it gets into, into fairy naughty land sometimes. It's so weird and that's why Officially, the DIA shut it down after a while and it started to be funded again with Bigelow's money and, and then it, 
it finally died off. Um, but uh, now here's the guy. I'm trying to think. Where are we? Uh, the guy that went under the name of Jonathan Axelrod. Um, he's now been publicly. His, his name is publicly revealed. Uh, he's turned up on the Skinwalker program as well. Name escapes me, but uh, you'll find out. Uh, um, Jonathan Axelrod, uh, he, he was from the Defence Intelligence Agency, had gone on the first day, he's there with two heavy duty Afghan war veterans, mates. They're doing the rounds at night, checking out the perimeter of the property. They've got thermal imaging gear on, you know, heavy duty kind of investigation. And then they're walking along and then suddenly, and you'll see it on one of the seasons of Skimwalker Ranch. The, uh, I've got to say, I have mixed feelings about the show, but it, it's, it's, it's certainly entertaining. But uh, when you try and get the facts, it's very, very hard to get the facts of, of that program. But this book helps. In this is not un under the current owner. This is all courtesy of Bigelow's time. And uh, here is... Uh, uh, these three military guys, including uh, uh, John, is it John um, who knows the head of the, uh, the UAP task force that before it became Arrow. Anyway, uh, he's the one that's walking down with these two offsiders and they hit a cold column of air and somehow they're overwhelmed with intense fear uh, and they're thinking, what the hell? These are guys that are hardened veterans from the Afghanistan war and they're going into a, like, like a, a wave of absolute abject fear and they're thinking, whoa, you know, they all stand back. They're all simultaneously experiencing this and one of them's aware through the thermal imaging gear that there's some mass appearing in front of them. And it's, it's described in a bit of detail in this and, and in other locations. And, and it, uh, the thing is, Axelrod... Um, uh, in company, they start to have this so-called hitchhiker effect. It didn't stop at the Skinwalker Ranch. It went home. He goes home and then gets shipped off to Afghanistan. His whole family starts having sightings of what? Wolfmen, dogmen in the backyard. You know, the, the, his wife, his sons become hysterical. You know, the, the, this thing's going on. It's not only him, it's others that had this experience now. Everybody kind of rejects that information and you're thinking, what the hell is going on here? Uh, and yet here is Harry Turner talking, uh, exactly the same thing happened to not only Vicky Klein, but to her neighbour. And it escalated to a whole contagion effect that they descended into this complex abduction contact narrative. Uh, so here's Harry talking way much earlier than, than uh, the new boys doing on the block that are doing this research right now. So we're coming to a close, aren't we? Yep, just about. Next. <laughs> and this, this is where it gets really crazy. I learn that Rod Barton, the author of The Weapons Detective, great book, uh, UN uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction Inspector, uh, and also the author of this book, Life of, of a Spy, worked for Harry Turner in the nuclear science section for five years. I thought, good guy to talk to. So I managed to contact Rod Barton and the full inter interaction I had with Rod Barton and myself um, is on my website. Th this is the, what I draw out of it. Now, I talked to Rod Barton about a UFO sighting that I know Harry must have investigated, but, but Barton's not aware of it. He says somewhat satirically in his book, he didn't think much of Harry's obsession with UFOs. But he went out, and, and some was somewhat contradictory, and, he, and Bob Barton did admit that it was a little bit kind of careless, but he, he didn't want the book to be a UFO book. He wanted it to be about what his focus was, and that was about weapons of mass destruction and looking for evidence of militarised investigations of nothing to do with UFOs. But he, he did think that he was a bit heavy-handed in his criticism. He admitted going out with... Harry on one investigation of a crop circle. Didn't get out of the car, he says. 
um, whatever, but Harry for some reason thought there was a crop circle or something in that area, go back. Anyway, later I asked, um, um, what kind of time, next slide, do you think Harry was going on with, uh, with UFOs in his time as head of the nuclear science section? And Rod comes back to me and says, 90% of his time was spent on UFOs and flying saucers. Can you imagine it? 90% of his time. And I, I was gobsmacked when he said that. I said, say what? You know, like, are you sure? And he comes back and says, oh, well, I might have exaggerated slightly, but it's got to have been between 70 to 80% of his time was devoted to UFOs. That, that I found astonishing. Um, but anyway, I thanked him for his time and, and uh, being honest about what, as far as it could be uh, with, with the uh, restrictions of classification and stuff like that. It, it gave me part of the story. You know, that it confirmed what I'd found, that Harry was seriously obsessed with UFOs and trying to get the upper echelons of the Department of Defence, particularly Defence Science, to look at the UFO problem, not a militarised investigation, a Defence Science investigation. But, Basically, we don't think that happened. It certainly didn't happen during the 70s. Is it happening now? Who knows? You would think a problem of that complexity and nature would be the subject of a serious engagement. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Officially, it's not. Our government, the Defence Department, says not interested in UFOs or UAPs. Talk to the Americans. They're the ones worried about it, that kind of thing. Next. I was just going to talk about crop circles, or oh, sorry, solid light, but uh, times against us, another time, another lecture. Uh, that's something I've been interested in for a long time. Uh, I took on a, uh, uh, I got asked to be a scientific advisor or at least an advisor to the new uh, society for UAP studies. I'm now on their consultants board, uh, advisory board. And I've actually used that process to submit an article about solid light through a peer review type of thing. And they're going to publish a, a journal that's going to be subject to sci scientific uh, <coughs> evaluation, peer review. And I've already had the article come back to me with the first round of peer review. And they're all fairly positive. We've got to say, a lot of typos. I said, yeah, sure, there were. You know, and fix that up, but also they wanted to get a few things changed, but hopefully it might get into this the first edition or the second edition of the new journal that's about to come out. So interesting times. Um, but the point of the paper is that here's this collection of data about solid light that should be being examined. It's worldwide. It goes back to, for the entire history of the UFO phenomenon, even back far earlier, records in ancient China. We're finishing. Oh, has people been hearing me? Oh, we're all selectively deaf. No, I don't think we need the mic, but anyway, we... Uh, what's happened to this thing again? Yep, okay. Yep, okay. So this is one classic case that really got me going again on solid light. Happened at Kayama. Next, this is the last slide. Yeah. If you want a bit of detail about crop... Oh, sorry, why well, must I got crop circles in my head? I blame Horace. Yeah, um, yeah he corrupted my mind. Um, article on solid light. This issue of New Dawn, a special issue, volume 13, number one. You can probably get it as a back issue. There's an interview with me and there's an article, I think, on solid light in that one as well. Um, so uh, just a general way to finish off. Thanks very much for your attention.